Well, I know it's not Christmas anymore, but this was my Christmas release this, this year and also my first romantic comedy. So I hope you guys enjoy A Merry Mistake. Chapter 1. Belle. Christmas is my favorite time of year. Seriously, I love it all. The absolutely magical decorations. There's an inflatable dragon drinking cocoa that I have to see every night, even though dragons aren't usually associated with Christmas. Twinkling strings of lights hanging from buildings and houses. The colored icicles are my favorite, but I enjoy the solid white ones too. And huge trees decorated with colorful ornaments. Plus, there's the food. I usually eat too much of that. The music. I start listening before Thanksgiving. And the snow, which we never get enough of, in my opinion. Seriously, everything. But my favorite part about Christmas this year is getting to spend a weekend with my friends at a beautiful resort that goes all out for Christmas. It's only about half an hour from where we live. But Rudolph Washington puts our little town to shame, and so does this lodge. Oh, the pictures did not do it justice, I breathe as we pull into the parking lot of the Snowflake Lodge. The lodge, which had been recently bought by a couple named Chris and Margie Kringle, if you can believe that, is a gingerbread house on steroids. The roof glistens the same chocolate brown as a Kit Kat bar, and the building itself is decorated with lights so bright that you could see them from the sky. White Jenga-style chimneys peek from each side, and snowflakes dot every window, outlining each glass pane regardless of size. Even though the part of the country we live in doesn't get a lot of snow, the lodge advertises a full-fledged Christmas experience, complete with horse-drawn carriage rides, an indoor ice skating rink, and a spectacular tree lighting ceremony, plus daily pictures with Santa starting on the 15th of December. Charlie kills the engine and nods as she looks up at the lodge. I have to agree, this looks fantastic. Now let's just hope they have a fitness facility. Charlie is the fitness guru of the group. Well, that's actually putting it nicely. Her passionate love for fitness and exercise is like no one else's. She is relentless in her pursuit of perfect health, like a drill sergeant drilling her troops. We are her friends, not her clients, and sometimes we have to remind her of that. We're only here for two nights, Hannah says as she opens her door. I think you can skip working out for two days. Probably three, depending on when we leave Sunday, Charlie grumbles. And I already had to cut my workout short today. I open my door and pull out my phone clicking my social media app as I do. When the video starts rolling, I smile. Well, guys, we officially made it to the Snowflake Lodge, and it is amazing. We haven't seen our room yet, but just check out this view. I pan the camera slowly over the massive stone building that holds the Snowflake Lodge. An archway, shaped like a snowflake floating in an ocean of white, welcomes us to the property. Snow drifts at the edges of the property and perches on the limbs of evergreen trees, giving everything a fairy tale appearance. There's no snow falling currently, but there's a covering on the ground already from a previous snowfall, glistening like a dusting of glitter. Evidently, we're scheduled to get more snow than usual this winter, and I am not complaining because I love snow. It makes everything look cleaner, more pristine. The trees and rooftops are coated in the delicate white, and though it's not dark yet, the Christmas lights decorating the lodge are already on and sparkling like tiny rays of hope. Are you going to record everything we do this weekend? 
Katie asks as my camera settles on her face. That is the price of fame. I shoot my tongue out at her, knowing the camera is facing away from me and my infantile gesture won't be seen by my fans. Don't worry, guys. Katie isn't always this grumpy, and a promise is a promise. Though you can't be here with me, you'll feel like you are. Gotta run for now, but comment on what your favorite thing to do over Christmas is, and I'll try to get some videos around those ideas. I tap the button to end the video, and then quickly type out a description and hashtags to upload it. You do realize you aren't famous, right? Katie's mouth twists into a frown as she tosses my bag at my feet. A little too forcefully, if you ask me. You're a cosmetologist. That is only half true. I am a cosmetologist, and I'm glad I am, as it made it easy to take the weekend off. But some of my income comes from my social media accounts, so I'm also kind of famous. I actually enjoy doing makeup makeovers. There is something about making a woman feel good about herself when she looks in the mirror. But I am looking forward to the day that it's no longer my main income. And that day is coming. I can feel it, like a soft buzzing in my bones, a vibration below my skin. It's been a slow build but I'm starting to get more money from my monetized social media accounts and incentives from businesses. I still can't believe they pay you to put up videos. Charlie's lip twitches in disdain as she rolls her eyes at me. I pick up my bag, shifting the straps on my duffel bag, trying not to wince at the strain of its overloaded contents. I've packed entirely too much, considering our limited stay, but you never know what to be prepared for, so I brought a little of everything. Hey, I've offered to start a channel for you. As a personal trainer, you could make a lot. Except that as a personal trainer, I have to work with my clients personally. That's sort of what the name means. She rolls her eyes at me like this is common knowledge, and she can't believe that I don't understand it. But I can't believe she doesn't understand the untapped potential she is letting slip by. I know she doesn't trust my opinion on a lot of things, but social media is my jam. And you could still do that, but you could also do tips and workouts they could do on their own and garner an online audience as well, it would be great for people who want to work out but don't want to go to the gym. The online commercial section is growing at an astronomical rate, Piper says, consulting her phone. The girl is a wizard when it comes to research. She can find just about anything in under two minutes, and what she can't find, she has stored in her head. I honestly think her brain must be bigger than most people's because of the sheer amount of knowledge stored there. I wouldn't be surprised if we found out she was the daughter of Albert Einstein or something. In this case, I do believe Belle is correct that you could increase your income if you added an online presence to your in-person business model. Charlie glares at her. I don't have time to shoot silly videos like Belle does. I have a real business to run. Girls, it's Christmas time. Perhaps we can hold off on the bickering for the next few days, Hannah says, stepping into her peacemaker role and shooting us pointed looks. Her dark hair is pulled back into a low ponytail, which makes her look both serious and authoritative. She's not a mother yet, but I like to call this particular look her mom look because it reminds me very much of the ones I used to get from my mother. Hannah swears she's perfected it because she helped raise her younger brothers, but however she got it, she's very good at it. Fine by me. I plan to enjoy this weekend. I hoist the bag a little higher on my shoulder. 
Okay, I probably could have left a few things at home. And lead the way to the front door, which is adorned with a giant wreath that smells strongly of pine. I don't always love the smell of pine. It's too pungent in candles and cleaners. But I don't mind it on Christmas trees and wreaths. However, I'm even more delighted as I pull the door open and the scent of cinnamon and sugar fills the air. A wave of warmth billows out with the delicious smell, enveloping me like a comfortable blanket. My mouth falls open as I step inside, because even though the pictures I looked at online were gorgeous, they don't even come close to seeing the room in person. Every inch of the room is Christmas, from the giant tree straight ahead that appears to reach all the way to the vaulted ceilings, to the twinkle lights hanging from the ceiling accented with holly and ivy, to the stuffed reindeers and snowmen placed strategically around. Oof! I'm pushed forward as someone bumps into me from behind. And okay, I shouldn't have stopped in the doorway, but the view is stunning. Wow, this is something. At least Katie doesn't seem upset that I was holding up her entrance. Right? I step to the side to let her enter, and then a cheery voice greets us from across the room. Welcome to the Snowflake Lodge. I glance to the right, where an elderly woman is rounding the corner of a check-in desk, a tray of chocolate chip cookies in her hand. Her short heels click on the polished marble floor as she walks. She is dressed head to toe in red, though her shirt has a white ring of fur around the collar. Her white hair is styled in a sensible bob, although a few wisps of hair seem to have escaped and now frame her face. I'm Margie Kringle, the owner here. Well, part owner. My husband Chris is around here somewhere probably sneaking cookies in the kitchen because our chef whipped them up just a few minutes ago. Thankfully, I managed to snag a few, and you girls look like you could use some cookies. She has a grand motherly voice and an accent I can't quite place. I can't always succumb to cookies. Part of my success is looking good on camera. But it's Christmas, so I smile and grab one. The cookie is still warm, and it literally melts in my mouth like a sugary, chocolatey river as I bite into it. Oh my gosh, this is so good. I'll never say it out loud, but if all the food is as good as this cookie, I may need a fitness center too. The other girls also grab a cookie, and then Margie leads us back to the counter to check in. Okay, let's get you girls checked in. Whose name is the reservation under? I raise my hand, feeling just a little silly. That would be me, Belle Duval. Ah, oh, Belle, I love that name. It reminds me of sleigh bells in the snow. She smiles wistfully for a moment and then snaps back to reality and taps a few keys on her computer. Okay, Belle, you are all checked in. You are in our Santa suite. I know you guys will love it there. The designer just finished it a few months ago, and we've had nothing but compliments ever since. She hands over the keys, which I'm a little disappointed to see are just regular key cards and not festive skeleton keys or something, and then points behind her to a hallway. The elevator is just down there. Your room is on the fourth floor. We have a spa, a pool, and a fitness facility on level one. Meals are served down here in the family room. She leans closer, like she's sharing a guilty secret. It's a cafeteria, but I like calling it a family room better. It feels homier that way. Am I right? Absolutely. I agree with a smile. I will definitely have to see if I can get Margie to let me film her, because it's clear she is part of the charm of this place. Let's see. Dinner is served from 6 to 8 p.m. 
breakfast from 6 to 8 a.m. and lunch from noon to 2. There are snacks available during the other hours if needed. And, of course, there are plenty of restaurants in town to choose from. You're only staying with us for the weekend? She looks up, and I swear there is a hint of sadness in her expression. It was all we could get off, but maybe we'll get to come back soon. I don't know why I feel the need to explain our stay length, but the words just tumble out. Margie tilts her head and smiles. Let's hope. Check out Is It Noon on Sunday then, and... She pulls a sheet of paper from beneath the counter. Here's a listing of all our Christmas activities. You came just in time for the tree lighting tonight. She gives us a wink and another wide smile. It's one of my favorite events. Thank you so much. I take the paper and stack of keys she hands me and give one to each girl. You're welcome. Let me know if you need anything else. We will. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, she calls after us as we head to the elevator. The Christmas cheer carries through the rest of the lodge, with tinsel and more wreaths hung on the walls and red and green tinsel surrounding the elevator. Wow, they really do it up here, Charlie says, as I punch the button to go up. It's amazing, right? The doors slide open and the soft sound of Christmas music spills out. I smile as I step in. Now this is my kind of elevator music. It's definitely festive, but do you think she'll leave the Christmas decorations up all year? Hannah asks as the doors close. If she doesn't, I'd hate to be the one in charge of putting them up and taking them down, Charlie says. Surely she will, though, Piper chimes in. Otherwise, she would undoubtedly lose business in the summer. Not everyone can handle Christmas year-round. I open my mouth to argue. I'm fairly certain I could handle Christmas year-round. Or at least part of it. The only downside is that it might lose some of its appeal. Although it would take an eternity to wear off completely. But there's no need to start a fight. At the fourth floor, there is a ding, and then we step off the elevator. There are only four suites on this floor. The Santa Suite, the Holiday Hideaway, the Elves Extravaganza, and the Winter Wonderland. Ours is to the right, but I can't help wondering if they all look the same. I wonder if we can befriend the people in the other suites and see inside theirs. That would be weird. Katie says with a shake of her head. Nobody meets and hangs out with their hotel neighbors. It wouldn't be weird if they're cool like us. What if one of them is a suite full of handsome guys? I wiggle my eyebrows at my friends. It's been a while since any of us have been out on a date, and I wouldn't mind spending my downtime with a handsome guy. Then I'm definitely out. I frown at her and roll my eyes. Katie isn't normally this much of a party pooper, but her fiancé broke up with her a month or so ago, and she's still salty. That's part of the reason I begged the girls to come, too. I knew we could all use a change of pace and scenery, even if only for a few days. Well, I could handle a cute guy for Christmas, Hannah says as she scans the card key on our room lock. There is a click, and then she opens the door to our magical escape. We have our own Christmas tree, and a fire flickers softly in a large fireplace. Mugs with cocoa sit on the table, along with more cookies, and Christmas music plays softly from somewhere. This is going to be awesome, I say, as I set my bag down. Chapter 2. Jackson. I hate Christmas. The lights, the laughter, the snow. We don't get much snow in Washington, at least not on the west side of the state. 
But every once in a while, a storm will slither down from Canada, take a sharp turn at Seattle, and dump an inch or two in Cooperville. This year looks to be one of those years, as we've already had two snowfalls and more is in the forecast. I suppose I could move to a warmer place like Arizona. That would help with the snow, at least. But I don't know of any place that doesn't have lights or laughter or celebrate Christmas. I'm not sure where else I'd even go, but every year around this time, I think about it. Seriously. Hey, boss. Dave, my best friend and office manager, pokes his head in the door. Actually, office manager is a bit of an elevated title, considering the office consists of just the two of us. But Dave and I met in college, and we've been friends ever since. So when he needed a job after his divorce, I couldn't say no. Sadly, Dave has let himself go over the last few years. His once muscular physique now looks more like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Rolls of fat that were once tight-toned muscle hang over his belt. Of course, it's not really his fault. Diane did a number on him. Besides, sitting behind a desk all day and going through a rough divorce can do that to a man. Although, to be fair, I'm not the same either. The only difference is that instead of turning to food, I turned to the gym when my heart was broken. Well, the gym and work. And it wasn't entirely Stacy who drove me into this line of work. The ridiculous mandate that I refused to comply with played a big role as well. But if Stacy hadn't blasted my story all over social media, maybe I could have found another department who would have hired me. What's up, Dave? It's after lunch, so I know he's not asking for lunch orders, though that is a nearly daily occurrence, and it's not quite closing time, so it's doubtful he's reminding me of that either. It is something that's on his daily checklist, however, and I do probably stay late too often. But it's not like I have anything to go home to besides my dog. Don't get me wrong, I love my dog, but she's not the best conversationalist. I was wondering... He pauses, but I can see the hope flickering in his eyes. Whatever he plans to ask me, it's something he knows I'll generally say no to. If you wanted to go see the tree lighting ceremony in Rudolph tonight... I sigh. The small town of Rudolph isn't known for much, but they go overboard about Christmas. They're actually listed as one of the Christmas town hideaways in Washington. Every year, there's a big tree lighting, horse-drawn carriage rides, a Santa parade, and more. Every year, the town draws tourists from all over. And every year, I try my best to avoid it. I don't know, Dave. I've still got paperwork to go through. I wave my hand at the papers on my desk, but they aren't really anything important. Was escorting a woman to a dinner that turned out to be uneventful. So I finished the paperwork hours ago. The rest of the papers are actually job applications I've been looking through, though I haven't told Dave yet. I don't even know if I'm interested in any of them. But the business isn't doing that great, and the urge to move on to something different is brighter this year. Come on, Jackson, all you do is work lately, and it's not like we're busy. He stares pointedly at the silent phones. They haven't rung all day, which isn't entirely surprising with it being Christmas. Most people are in the helping mood, which makes crime, and my usefulness, Go down. That should make me happy, but happy doesn't pay the bills. And if a few jobs don't come in soon, I'm going to have to close down or add some new services. Dave looks back to me and continues. You need to get out more. And the tree lighting is perfect. It's fun and there's good food. I snort before I can stop myself and immediately regret the noise as a look of hurt crosses Dave's face. I know I've gotten out of shape. It's my goal to change that in the new year. 
but at least I'm trying to regain my life. You're just... He pauses, clearly searching for the right word. Existing. He's not wrong. That does feel like all I'm doing. The town is small, and business is pretty slim. What we do get isn't really what I signed up for. I sit at this desk all day, thinking back to my time on the force, and wondering if I made the right decision to leave. Especially since I ended up at a job where I sit behind a desk all day. Only this one doesn't come with nearly enough busy work, so the hours feel longer. Besides, we promised Ethan we'd be there. Ethan is the third stooge in our friendship. He was always a little different than Dave and me, but he's really withdrawn after his failed marriage, which was only partly his fault. Ethan was a little too focused on his films, but his wife was a little too focused on her boss. Thankfully, his new project, whatever it is, he never tells us until film night, seems to be cheering him up some. I take a deep breath. As much as I don't want to go out and be around happy people, I did promise Ethan, and breaking promises is not something I'm in the habit of doing. You're right. I've been dwelling in my funk for too long. I turn off my computer and grab my coat from the back of the chair. Let's go get some food and watch them light up a giant tree. Really? I hate the way his eyes light up like this is the best thing that's happened to him in ages. Surely I haven't been that bad of a friend. Have I? Yes, really. In fact, let's go now. It's a few minutes before the end of my day, but it's not like I'll be missing any calls. Now? His eyebrows arch toward his receding hairline as he flips his wrist over to read his watch. There's still ten minutes of your day left. Who are you and what have you done with Jackson Powers? Ha ha, very funny. It's a dig, but I take it in stride. Come on, wise guy. Let's go for a drive. At least we have to drive to Rudolph. I can't remember the last time I walked anywhere around here. Walking makes you slow down. It makes you think and have to react when people smile and wave at you, which they do all the time in Cooperville. It's much safer to just drive, even though you could walk nearly everywhere in this town, because no one speaks to you when you drive. They used to wave, though they've stopped doing that too. Maybe I have become a bit of a Grinch, but with good reason. The cold air stings my skin, as if needles are pricking it as we exit the office, and I almost reconsider my offer. If it's cold here, it will be in Rudolph as well, and I didn't really dress for the cold this morning, not expecting to be out in it for longer than a few minutes the time it takes to get from the car into the building and back again. But I don't rescind the offer. Even though I can feel the cold seeping into my bones and my fingers slowly turning to ice, I keep my word and lead the way to my car. Rudolph is only about a half hour away, although the traffic makes this trip a little longer, and we have to park on the far side of town. As we head toward the downtown on foot, I check out the shops. Businesses around here don't really go under, like in most places. They get passed from generation to generation, so they haven't changed much over the years. Like Cooperville, Rudolph seems like a town frozen in time. Man, is it cold out, Dave says, blowing out little streams of white vapor with each word. Well, it is winter. Some winters it stays around 40 degrees, but we had such a long summer this year that winter has hit harder than normal too. There's still a dusting of snow on the ground and the temperature hasn't gotten above 30 in days. Though it means little to me, people have been whispering that we might even have a white Christmas this year. Yeah, but I don't remember it being this cold. Dave's teeth aren't chattering yet, but the muscles in his jaw are flexing, so it won't be long. 
That's because we haven't spent time outside in ages. I guess that's true. Christmas lights, multicolored and blinking, are strung in between the normal street lights and adorn every storefront. So even though it's pitch black outside, the path before us is clear. And before I know it, we are smack in the middle of town in front of the giant indoor ice rink. The tree they light up stands just in front of the rink, and there is already quite the crowd in front of it. Wow, I forgot how many people come to these things, Dave says softly beside me, and once again I feel like a horrible friend. How long have I kept him from enjoying events like this? I mean, it's not like I tie him up and keep him from coming, or even tell him he can't. He's a grown man, for goodness sake. But Dave hates going places alone. He always has, even before Diane ripped his heart to shreds. And Ethan is often busier than both of us. Yeah. It's lame, but it's all I can think to say at the moment. Thankfully, I am saved by the mayor's voice filling the air. Welcome to Rudolph's Christmas tree lighting, she says, and a cheer erupts from the crowd. We've been lighting this tree for longer than I can remember. Excuse me, excuse me, I just need to get a little closer. I turn to see who the obnoxious woman is, whose voice is now louder than the mayor's, and I roll my eyes when I spot her. She's obviously a tourist, as her coat doesn't look nearly warm enough, and her hands are devoid of gloves. Even more telling is the camera in her hand. I'm sorry, but I've got to get a video of this for my fans. Typical. I mutter the word quietly under my breath. I swear. But the woman must have hearing like an elephant, because she whips her head in my direction. I'm sorry. What was that? Nothing. I shake my head and try to return my focus to the tree lighting ceremony, but Blondie is having none of it. No, you clearly said something. If you don't have the guts to say it to my face, then maybe you shouldn't say it at all. The woman has lowered her camera, thankfully. I don't need any negative publicity, especially since it would probably affect my business but her other hand is jammed so hard into her hip that I fear she may leave a permanent indent. She's trying to seem tough, but her words remind me of an elementary teacher more than anything else. Your camera. You pushed through the crowd like you were more important than anyone else here, just so you could show some video to your fans. I put air quotes around the word to emphasize my disdain for these influencer types. It's typical, is all. Her eyes widen, and her mouth drops into this perfect O shape. It's a nice mouth, I'll give her that, but the look on her face is almost comical, like no one has ever dared to insult her choice of a non-job. Welcome to the real world, sister. You know nothing about me, she snaps. My fans care about what I do, and I know they would love to see this tree lighting. Which you're both missing, Dave hisses. Can you keep it down? I open my mouth to respond, but before I can, a group of women appear behind the blonde. Belle, you can't run off like that, one of them says. Her hair is pulled back in a ponytail and her face appears free of makeup. Her body is hidden beneath her clothes, but there is an air about her that declares she's tough. Definitely not an elementary teacher. Charlie's right. There are over 64,000 missing women in America, and half of them were single women. This woman is the stereotype of an intellectual complete with the glasses that swallow her face and clothing that does the same to her body. I'm sorry, the blonde, evidently aptly named Belle, says. I just wanted to get a video, but this guy... She jabs a finger in my direction. Felt the need to get into it with me. I didn't feel the need to get into anything with you. I simply stated that your rude behavior was typical of influencers. 
who think the world revolves around them. See? She looks to her friends. See what I mean? Forget him. The one called Charlie says with a firm shake of her head. She puts a hand on Belle's arm and begins to pull her in the other direction. We're here to have fun, not get in fights with the locals. When the girls are gone, Dave speaks up again. Seriously? That girl was beautiful, and you had to be a jerk. They're just tourists, I say with a shrug. It's not like we'll see them again. So not the point, Jackson. So not the point. And he's right, but I can't seem to make myself care. So instead, I turn back to the tree to find some of the joy I used to have before Stacy trampled on my heart. Oh, good. You guys made it. Ethan says, appearing beside us. Isn't this amazing? Yeah, I'm so glad you made us promise to come. That's the only reason I got Jackson out here tonight, Dave says, clapping a hand on my shoulder. I can't wait for you guys to see what else I have in store. There's a light in Ethan's eyes that I haven't seen in a long time, and I push the ghost voice of my past out of my mind. Tonight is about focusing on my friends. Chapter 3 Bell. Can you believe the nerve of that guy? I should just let it go, but I can't. I'm not used to people being so rude to me. I was just trying to get a video. Charlie shrugs. You were being kind of pushy. I was not being pushy, I say defensively. I was being commanding. There's a difference. A tiny snort escapes Charlie's mouth as she shakes her head and mumbles. Not when you do it. I can't believe you yelled at him, Hannah says. He was handsome. And rude. Who cares how good looking he is if he's rude? And okay, he was handsome. More than handsome, actually. He was like Tom Cruise handsome, except for the scowl that seriously lowered his score. But I still can't believe my friends are more focused on his looks than the way he treated me. I didn't notice the guy, Katie says, as we head back toward the shopping part of town. But the tree lighting was beautiful though I've always wondered how they get the lights so high. Cooperville, where we live, is near the water, and while trees in Washington get tall, we don't have a lot of them on the coast, so our tree lighting is usually strings of light coming off a giant pole in several directions to resemble a tree. It's pretty, but not nearly as pretty as the real thing lit up. Plus, this town had ornaments for the kids to hang, which is something you definitely can't do on the tree back home. And they were so cute hanging them. I've already gotten a ton of comments on that video. They use a crane, of course, Piper says, as if this should be common knowledge. That's not quite as romantic as I imagined, Katie says, wrinkling her face. Is there more to do tonight? Hannah pulls out the guide that Margie gave us. Her forehead furrows as she reads. Hmm, it doesn't look like anything else tonight, unless we want to check out the chocolate village back at the lodge, or have cookies and milk with Santa. She glances down at her watch, though that ends in half an hour. I wouldn't mind heading back to the lodge. Charlie rolls her head from side to side something she does often because she claims it loosens the muscles around her neck. I keep telling her that if she didn't work out so often, she probably wouldn't be so tense. But she has yet to take my advice. The walk was good, but my muscles are still tired from so little use today, so I would love to find the gym and maybe a hot tub after. Hannah's eyes light up at that. Ooh! A hot tub does sound nice and warm. My fingers are starting to turn into little ice cubes. I may have to add better gloves to my purchases while I'm here. 
I also wouldn't mind returning to the lodge, Piper says. I have some work to do on my paper. Katie rolls her eyes. Piper, it's Christmas vacation. Surely you can take a few days off. Piper shakes her head. I already had to readjust my timeline to take the days off for the trip. I can't lose all my work time. Besides, you said there was nothing else going on tonight. Therefore, it is a perfect time. I can stop in at Chocolate Village with you and then retire to get some work done. Katie lets out an exasperated sigh, but there's no arguing with Piper. The woman is smarter than all of us, probably smarter than all the rest of us combined. Besides, this is common behavior for her. I'm pretty sure she would stay locked in her room all day if we didn't drag her out. Katie shifts her gaze to me. How about you, Belle? Um, I do want to see the Chocolate Village, but I'd like to do some shopping in town before I head back. My fingers are cold, too, and I could use a warmer coat. We're only here for two days, Katie says. Do you really need more clothing in addition to the bag you packed? Charlie nods and flashes the other girls a look. Plus, I don't know if you should be out here alone. Yeah, I agree, Belle. I mean, Piper just rattled off all those statistics about missing women. Hannah looks to Piper as if hoping she'll reiterate her statistics. Guys, I'll be fine. Look at how many people there are around us. Nothing is going to happen to me. I'll get some shopping done, make a few content videos, and then I'll be back at the lodge. Besides, you guys do know I go places in Cooperville by myself. They're acting like I'm 16 and still in high school, instead of a woman in her mid-twenties who is capable of functioning alone in society. Yeah, but you live there. You know your way around, most of the time. Katie is obviously referencing the time I got lost visiting my sister. To be fair, though, Cecily had rented a cabin in Port Townsend, and I got it confused with Port Angeles. It was a pretty simple mistake. They're both ports. And I didn't really end up lost. I just ended up in the wrong town. I glance around. We haven't explored the whole town, but it seems fairly small and very simply laid out. The lodge is the focal point, and the shopping part of town extends to the left and right. Beyond that is the more industrial part, and then the residential part of which I have no intention of going. It seems pretty straightforward to me. All the shops are either that way, I point to the right, or that way. I point to the left, feeling a little like the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. Are you sure you want to do it alone? Katie bites her lip and looks at the others. We could all come shopping tomorrow with you. I lift an eyebrow. Really? You want to come shopping with me tomorrow? I've tried to get my friends to come shopping with me. Often but they always refuse. And okay, the one and only time they went with me, I did take an extraordinarily long time. But it was only because I had to get the perfect pair of shoes and none of the ones in the store were fitting quite right. Normally, my shopping doesn't take that long. Well, that's not entirely true. If there's a really good sale, it might take even longer. But still... Katie's face morphs into this weird expression that is part disgust and part fear. You know what? You're right. You're a grown woman with a cell phone. I'm sure you'll call us if you need anything. Right, girls? Yeah, right. They all nod in agreement, but none of them look confident in my ability. I'll be fine. No more than an hour. Two tops and I promise to call if I need anything. I take my phone out and wave it around for good measure. Though Charlie still doesn't look convinced, she follows the rest of the girls back to the lodge, and I pull up my social media app. 
Hey guys, I'm here in beautiful Rudolph, Washington. I know you got to see the Christmas tree lighting a little bit ago, and while it was pretty on camera, it was even better in person. If you can make the trip to Rudolph some Christmas, I highly recommend it. The rest of the girls have gone back to the lodge, but I thought we would go shopping. Store owners don't generally like their merchandise being filmed, even if it is for free publicity. So I scan the row of stores but turn the video off before entering the first one. It's a quaint shop filled with purses and a few other leather items. I try a few on, but nothing really strikes my fancy. I guess I'm not really feeling like a new purse tonight. I do, however, purchase a warmer pair of gloves, and I swear my skin almost thanks me as I pull them on before stepping back into the frosty air. I am the queen of lotion. I carry one in my purse, one in my car, several in our house, and I packed at least two. But no matter how much lotion I slather on my hands, the cold air always causes my skin to crack around my knuckles. Charlie tells me it's probably from some vitamin deficiency, but if that means eating Brussels sprouts, I'll live with the lotion treatment. The next store is a kitschy Christmas collectible store with rows and rows of ornaments, decorated trees, and other holiday-themed items. I wander down the ornament aisle. When I was young, my mother would buy each of us an ornament for our tree every year. When I moved out, I decided to continue the tradition with my roommates. And even though we haven't put up our normal tree yet this year, I can't not get them something. The easiest one to find is Charlie's. She does all sorts of personal training, but boxing is her favorite, and the little red glove that says Merry Christmas will be perfect for her. I grab a book with the cutest pair of glasses glued on the cover for Piper. For Hannah, I get a face staring up at a tree. It's not perfect, but it's the closest thing I can find to a brain, since she is obsessed with psychology. I grab a glittery cell phone for myself, but Katie... I walk up and down the aisles looking for something perfect for Katie. Of all of us, she's the hardest to shop for. It's not that she's picky, she would love anything, but there's no one thing that defines her like the rest of us. In fact, she's been in a bit of a funk lately, ever since Adam broke up with her. I finally find a little bar graph. It's not the most creative gift I've ever found, but Katie works at an advertising agency, so at least it's related to what she does. After paying for the ornaments, I wander into a local restaurant and grab a hot chocolate. I thought my coat would be heavy enough, but it's so much colder this year. And even though I'm spending most of my time in the stores, the frigid air bites through my layers every time I step outside. I'm looking around for a table when I hear a deep voice behind me. Hey, did you hurt yourself? Turning, I find a handsome man smiling at me. He has blue eyes and a dimple. He's not quite as attractive as tree lighting guy, but he seems nicer which automatically gives him a few points. What? I asked if you hurt yourself. He pauses and winks at me. When you fell from heaven. And I have to take those points back. Bad pickup lines might be even worse than rude behavior. Guess I'm foregoing a table and taking my drink outside. I've heard some lame pickup lines before, but that has got to be one of the corniest. I flash him a tight smile and head for the door, but my path is impeded by the crowd that entered behind me. You must be tired, he says, falling into step beside me, because you've been running through my mind all day. He's probably harmless and maybe even a little inebriated, but for some reason, his words make me crack, and I whirl on him. You know what I am tired of? Your tired lines. 
You don't know me, and you just saw me two minutes ago, so there's no way I've been running through your mind. Maybe you should try to be a little more creative with your come on lines if you want them to actually work. I didn't think my voice was very loud, but several people around us turn and issue an ooh, as if I've just delivered the comeback of the century. A tiny bit of guilt flares in my stomach, but thankfully Mr. Terrible Pickup Line takes the hint and wanders off. I continue out the door. As soon as I'm away from the crowds, I pull out my phone again. You guys will never believe this. I just had someone throw the worst pickup lines at me in the middle of a cafe. Ooh, I know what. How about you guys comment with the worst pickup lines you've ever received, and we'll vote on the winners. I'll pick up something from Rudolph here and send it to the winners. I smile as the comments start pouring in. Being an influencer may not be my sole job, but it's definitely my favorite job, at least when I strike a chord like this. There's something about connecting people that makes me feel good. Okay, I'm going to head back to the lodge now, but you guys keep commenting, and I'll check this video before I leave to determine a winner. With a wave, I end the video and put my phone back in my pocket. I turn left toward the lodge, but when I glance up, I realize I have no idea where I'm at. Oh man, I've done exactly what my friends were afraid of. In my attempt to get away from the crowds so I wouldn't have much chatter on my video, I have wandered off the main streets and now find myself in a much darker part of town. Still, the lodge is pretty big and the mountain is behind it. I should be able to at least see it. But when I shift my gaze up, all I can see are buildings. Crud, I'll have to see if I can find an open space where I can see the lodge. I take a left at the next street, because I think that's the way to the lodge. But it opens up to a small park-like area lit up with the soft glow of streetlights, and I freeze. No one ever tells you what you should do when you witness a murder. They tell you how to increase your chances of not getting murdered, avoid sketchy neighborhoods, walk with a friend, never wear earbuds in both ears when you're alone. I hate that one because then the music is off-balanced. Anyway, all of these are great pieces of advice, although not exactly helpful for my current situation. But no one tells you what to do when you witness a gruesome murder in broad daylight. Okay, it's not broad daylight. It's not even like the beginning of dusk where the sky looks like it's painted orange and red and pink with some enormous paintbrush. But it is light enough to see, and soft flakes of white are falling from the sky. It would be gorgeous and breathtaking if it weren't for the little matter of the murder unfolding before me. So yeah, while it's not exactly light, it's light enough. There is no mistaking the knife that is glinting in the light, or the blood-curdling scream from the woman as said knife slices into her stomach, or the pool of blood that begins puddling around her like a scarlet lake. I'm pretty sure my high school English teacher would be proud of my use of adjectives, but that doesn't really make me feel better at the moment. Then there is another scream, this one clouded with fear instead of pain, and I only realize that the noise has escaped from my mouth when the knife-wielding maniac looks up and catches my eye. I have no doubt that anyone in my situation would have done the same. I mean, if you don't scream when you witness someone killed in front of you, then there might be something wrong with you. But in hindsight, this was not the brightest move, because now the assassin is hollering at someone to get me. Oh, great. He has an accomplice? I didn't even see an accomplice, but I certainly do now. Thankfully, the man heading towards me looks like he's eaten a few too many donuts in his life, and I take off running, my lips whispering a prayer as I go. I don't know exactly where I'm running, but far away from here. 
Hey, come back here. I don't stop to glance behind me, but I know the man is there. His heavy footsteps slap the damp pavement, and I can hear his ragged, labored breathing. He's crazy if he thinks I'm going to stop and let him kill me too. I'm not a runner, not by a long shot, but I have no doubt that Charlie would be proud of me today. Charlie has been on the rest of us to take up running for years. But I hate running. On a normal day, my idea of running is rushing to get my coffee in the morning. But today is not a normal day, and I kick it into full gear. Luckily for me, I'm younger and fitter than the man chasing me. And after a few twists and turns, the sound of echoing footsteps behind me slows and then disappears. I pause long enough to catch my breath and take stock of my surroundings. The falling snow hasn't stuck enough to capture footsteps, thankfully, but it has gotten thicker, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. On one hand, it makes it harder to see, so perhaps the killer will have a harder time finding me. But on the other hand, it's going to make it harder to find my way back. If the lodge was hard to find before, It certainly won't be easier now. Holding my breath, I listen for footsteps or heavy breathing, but it is quiet. I scan the area around me, and when I'm convinced that no one is going to attack me, I walk to the closest street sign, Park Place and Memphis. I have no memory of these names, although I'm pretty sure they're also names in Monopoly. I haven't played that game in ages, but I used to love it when I was growing up. As long as I could be the banker. I didn't love the game and was pretty terrible at it, but I loved being in charge of the fake money. Maybe that's where my obsession with money came from. Darn you, Monopoly, I whisper softly. Okay, think, Belle. Just retrace your steps. Oh, and keep an eye out. You never know if that guy might be hiding somewhere. This sage advice sounds exactly like my dad in my head. I have a habit of doing that, putting the words in my head to people's voices. You know, whoever is most likely to say it. Right now, it's my dad, and that calms me down slightly. My dad is big and smart and safe, and so I began the process of returning the way I ran. I keep close to the walls of the buildings and before every alley or street intersection, I look both left and right before crossing. Park Place and Frankfurt. Park Place and Fourth. Park Place and Rodeo. Rodeo? Suddenly, I brighten. Rodeo is familiar. I remember it because it reminded me of Rodeo Drive in California. I've never been, but it's definitely on my wish list one day. This Rodeo didn't have the same selection of shops, but at least I know I was on Rodeo. Sure enough, as soon as I turn onto Rodeo Street, I can see the lodge before me. Quickening my speed, I don't know how I have any energy left to do that, I hurry into the lodge and up to our room, glancing behind me every few steps to make sure that Donut Man or Knife Wielder are still not there. When I finally throw open the door, I am out of breath and probably harried looking. Belle, are you okay? Katie looks up as I enter. She's the only one in the room, but it doesn't matter. The others will find out soon enough. I shake my head. I just witnessed a murder. Chapter 4 Belle They don't believe me. I can read it on their faces. Well, Katie might, but she's the only one. Hannah has this patronizing look on her face that I hate. The one that basically says, Oh, Belle, you're so cute, but there's no way you actually saw a murder. Charlie's face is impassive, but she's probably debating whether to berate me for not taking her self-defense class sooner or to tell me to take it for the umpteenth time. And Piper's face is buried in her smartphone. She is looking up statistics. 
There were 364 homicides in Washington last year, which is an increase of nearly 6% over the year before. So while the situation is improbable, it is not impossible that Bell did witness a crime. Piper looks up and pushes her glasses back into place. They always slip down just slightly when she bends her head down. My mouth falls open in surprise. Piper is on my side? Piper is never on my side, mainly because she and I deal in opposites. I like to go by feeling, and she prefers to follow facts. And okay, she's not exactly on my side. She did say improbable, which I'm pretty sure means not likely. But she's definitely more on my side than Hannah or Charlie. Okay, but this is Rudolph. Their murder rate has to be almost zero. Hannah says. It's a sleepy tourist town. Actually, their crime ranking is 16.1, Piper says. One is the safest, so while Rudolph is on the lower side, it is actually higher than some of the surrounding towns. You're not helping! Hannah throws her arms up in exasperation. Piper shrugs. I'm simply relaying the facts. Charlie rubs a hand across her forehead. Okay, let's think this through logically. Have you gone to the police yet? I shake my head. I don't even know where the police station is in this town. Plus, I... My gaze drops to the floor because I know they're going to give me a hard time for the next few words. I got a little lost, so I was just trying to get back to the lodge. You got lost? Hannah folds her arms across her chest and glares at the other girls. See, I told you we shouldn't have let her go on her own. She got lost on a street that really only had two directions. You said it was either right or left. So how exactly did you get lost? To be fair, I wandered off the main street when I was filming a video. It was getting a lot of comments, and I needed to get away from the crowds so I could be heard. Hannah rolls her eyes and huffs, but it's Charlie who speaks. I think we should take this to the police. If it's nothing, they can sort through it. But if it is something, then they should know as soon as possible. I agree, Piper adds. If this is a real murder, then every minute that goes by is crucial. It is a real murder. I saw a woman get stabbed for goodness sake. Look, how about you and I head to the police station to file a report, and we'll go from there. Charlie grabs her coat and throws it on, not caring that her hair is still wet from the hot tub. Yeah, just a second. I dart into the bedroom and grab a hat from my luggage. My eyes drift to the sunglasses too, but it's dark out. Wearing them might garner more attention than going without, so I decide against them. But I do change my coat. There's no reason to go out looking exactly the same as I did when I was seen. I have no idea if the killer is staying at this lodge, but I don't want to take any chances. I'm glad that Charlie has volunteered to go to the police station with me. We may not always be the closest but there is no one I'd rather have with me this late at night in an unfamiliar town. When I re-enter the living room, Charlie blinks as she sees me, then shakes her head. Okay, let's go. As she opens our door, the door to one of the other suites opens as well, and a man steps out. Instinctively, I jump behind Charlie, and she tenses as if preparing for action. What is it? She whispers. But before I can reply, the guy speaks up. Oh, hey, you must be our neighbors. I'm Ethan. Nice to meet you. He holds out a hand and Charlie shakes it. But I'm still frozen. There is a lovely British lilt to his voice that I would find charming at any other time. But this man has brown hair like the killer. He's clean shaven and the killer wasn't but he could have shaved. Was there time for that? Probably not, but I could have the facial hair wrong. Maybe it was just a shadow I saw. It was a little far for me to see much, 
so I watch him for any sign that he recognizes me. Of course, I'm hoping that even if he is the killer, that he won't recognize me in my disguise. But it was just thrown together. Tomorrow, I'll go in search of a wig. Charlie, she says, and this is Belle. Sorry, she's shy. It's nice to meet you, but we're kind of in a hurry. I wish she hadn't given my name, but at least she doesn't volunteer any more information. Unfortunately, Ethan follows us to the elevator. I mean, it makes sense that he was probably heading that way too, but it doesn't sit well with me. So how long are you guys staying? Ethan asks as Charlie punches the button. I try to send mental messages to Charlie not to answer. That doesn't work, but at least Charlie does stay vague. Not long, you? The elevator opens and we all step inside. I stay close to Charlie's side, but also close to the corner. Ethan does not seem phased as he answers. A few days. I'm working on a project. You guys from around here? Charlie shakes her head. No, just enjoying the festivities. Yeah, me too. I'm not from around here either, but my work brought me here. I think about asking him what his work is, especially since he's being very vague. But the elevator reaches the bottom floor at that moment and the doors open. Well, nice to meet you, Charlie says taking my arm and leading me out of the elevator. We'll probably see you around. Yeah, have fun. Ethan flashes a wave and heads right. Charlie and I head left to the check-in counter. Margie is still behind the station, and I wonder if the woman ever sleeps. Hi, Margie. Can you tell us where the police station is located? Margie's eyes widen in alarm. Oh, dear. Has something happened? We have security here at the lodge. We could try to handle it first. I shake my head. It didn't happen at the lodge. It happened in town. I see. Margie pauses for a moment, obviously hoping for more, but I don't offer, and neither does Charlie. Yes, let me get you a map, she says, when the silence becomes uncomfortable. She rifles under the desk for a minute and then lays out a large map of the town. Okay, the lodge is here. She draws a circle around the lodge. And the police station is here. She draws an X on it. It's a pretty straight walk, but a long one. And I'd feel better if you girls would let our shuttle driver take you there. He can even wait and give you a return ride as well. Charlie glances at her watch. It has to be nearly nine by now, and I know she is weighing the options. How long do you think that will take? Oh, he's here now. We don't have anyone coming in from the airport tonight, and he only does day tours, so I promise he's free. Well, if you're sure, thank you. Margie nods and picks up a walkie-talkie. Frank, can you have the van out front in a few minutes? I have some guests who need transportation. There is a pause, a crackle, and then a deeper voice answers back. Sure thing, boss. Be there in five. Thank you, Charlie says. Margie smiles at her and then turns to me. You're both welcome, and I meant what I said about our security. If you have any issues here at the lodge, don't hesitate to come to security or call me. I nod and thank her as well, before following Charlie to the front entrance. A few minutes later, we're climbing into a nice shuttle van, and a few minutes after that, Frank has pulled up in front of a drab brown building. It's weird, because as different as Rudolph is from Cooperville, there are some similarities, like that it's almost two different places. Back home, there is the downtown area near the water that is touristy and fun and colorful, and then there's the business district that looks like it was colored only with shades of brown. Rudolph is similar. The downtown is vibrant and touristy, and the more industrial part of town is further out and less colorful. The police station sits in that area and happens to be one of the ugliest buildings downtown, the walls are solid brick, 
but the building is old, so the brick is a musty, brownish color. I don't know if musty can describe a color, but that's the only way I can describe it. Maybe it was pretty when they first built it, though I doubt it. More likely, the designer was just awful and literally created the ugliest building. Regardless, time and the elements have taken a toll on it, and not for the better. Charlie and I thank Frank before exiting the van and walking up to the front door, which is solid glass. However, there's a tent to it that tells me it probably has that film on it that keeps the glass from shattering if it's broken. It's not quite bulletproof, but evidently it slows the process down. Piper made me watch a documentary with her on it, and while I found most of the documentary boring and dry, the cop who explained about the window tent was nice to look at, so I remember his bit. Once we get inside, the show is all yours, Charlie says, and I nod and take a deep breath. As soon as I pull the door open, I notice the contrast immediately. The inside isn't loud, per se, but there's a definite hum of chatter and computers and the like. I expect it to look a little nicer on the inside, but nope. The entire room is shades of beige, and the front desk inside is as ugly as the building out front. Beige and brown and built like a rectangle, it has no personality. Nor does the woman behind it, whose gray hair hangs in a no-nonsense bob, around her makeupless face. It's a good thing Charlie came with me and not Hannah. Hannah would be having a fit over the monochromatic color scheme. She'd be shouting something about this not working with people's personalities. I don't know if that's an actual thing, but as an artist, it's definitely messing with me. I'm not even an interior decorator, but I have an urge to put a little color on the wall. Can I help you? Even the woman's voice is flat and lifeless. I squash the desire to offer her a makeover. She'd be a tough palette for sure, but I could do little improvements. Makeup, for one thing. Just a light eyeshadow and soft lipstick would ease some of the harsh lines on her face. And her hair? It looks like a mop, but I think with a little body that she could rock it, even with the nearly completely gray color. And of course, if we put some brown back into it, that's not what I'm here for, though, and I have the feeling she might not appreciate my gesture, so I don't offer. Yes, I need to report a crime. I witnessed a murder. The woman lifts an eyebrow at me. A murder, huh? And where was this? My forehead furrows as I think. In town? Although I'm not exactly sure which area of town. You see, I was chased after I saw the murder, but when I stopped, I was at Park Place in Monroe. No, that's not right. Park Place in Tennessee? Sorry, do you have a Monopoly board around here? I know it was one of those streets. I glance around as if I expect to spot a game closet or a corner shelf filled with board games and books, like you see in some coffee shops. But then I remember that this is a police station and not a laid-back coffee shop, and while there is probably coffee here, I doubt it is the fancy kind. No sugar cookie almond milk latte here. There's no dilly-dallying here. It's all business all the time, and the woman behind the desk does not look pleased at my lack of proficient memory. The woman tilts her head at me and narrows her eyes. Let me get this straight. You want me to investigate a murder that happened on a Monopoly board? I exhale in frustration. No, not on the board. The street where I ended up is one that's on the board. I'll remember it when I see it, but I was a little shaken up. I saw a woman get stabbed in case you forgot that part. Uh-huh, and what about you? She turns to Charlie. Are you here to report a sunken battleship? Or maybe tell me that it was Miss Scarlet with the gun? It was a knife, I say, at the same time that Charlie says, I'm just here for support. 
Right. Well, have a seat and I'll get a detective with you in just a moment. She points to a row of three chairs that look like they came from an airport when it was remodeled. They're a gray vinyl sprinkled with white tears in the fabric. Charlie and I each take a seat, but it's clear that the female cop doesn't believe me. Perhaps the detective will be a little more open, and while I wait, maybe I can find the name of the street. I pull out my phone and begin to search for pictures of the Monopoly board online. What are you doing? Charlie hisses. This is no time to live stream. I'm not live streaming. I'm looking for the street name. It takes a few minutes, but finally I find one I can enlarge and begin to scan the titles. Boulevard, Tennessee, Memphis. That's it! Memphis! It was Park Place in Memphis! I holler to the woman behind the desk. But when I look up, it's not the woman I see, but a man. Weathered and graying and reeking of the smell of cigarettes. This is who is supposed to investigate the murder? I'm Detective Stanton. Would you like to come with me, Miss? Duval. Belle Duval, and this is my friend Charlie, though she didn't see the murder. He lifts an eyebrow. She's not a witness? No, sir, just moral support. I don't offer any more explanation, because I don't want to spend any more time in his presence than I have to. The sickening scent of stale cigarettes is already attaching itself to my clothes. I'll have to hang them outside to remove the stench, something I haven't had to do since college. Back then, I had a friend who liked going to clubs to dance. While I enjoyed dancing, I did not enjoy coming home smelling like an ashtray. The first time, I simply washed the clothes, but the odor hung around, which was when Adrian taught me about leaving clothes outside. Evidently, the wind and fresh air helped dislodge the foul odor so that then the wash would lift the rest. A solution for sure, but I'd still rather not smell like cigarettes. We follow Detective Stanton to a small cubicle in the far corner of the room. If his office space is any indication of his seniority, they have pushed me off onto the worst detective in the place. He motions to the two chairs across from the tiny desk before taking a seat in his chair, which creaks and groans beneath his weight but somehow doesn't collapse. Charlie sits, hardly paying attention, but I glance down at my proffered chair and then perch on the edge. The rest of the chair does not look clean, and I'm wearing a pair of my more expensive pants. Now what can I do for you, Miss Duvall? As I told the lady at the desk, I need you to investigate a murder. A man stabbed a woman, and then he sent his accomplice after me when he realized I saw it. I escaped, but I have no doubt he'll come after me, and I need police protection. The man blinks at me as if the words I've uttered are a foreign language to him. Police protection might be jumping the gun a little. Why do you think he'll come after you? Because that's what always happens. Haven't you seen the shows? Anytime someone witnesses a murder, The perpetrator comes after them. No loose ends, right? Right. He draws the word out into three syllables as he nods. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Where did you see this murder? Here in town. I'm not exactly sure where I was when I saw the murder. It was a darker side of town. You see, I'd been shopping and I wanted some hot chocolate. I was planning to drink it there, but then this really obnoxious man kept trying to hit on me, so I took my drink outside. I figured a video where viewers could comment with the worst pickup lines they've heard would be good, but it was kind of loud, so I walked away from the crowds without knowing exactly where I was going. Oh my gosh! I gasp and blink at the detective. Do you think he could be involved too? The pickup line guy? He was a nice-looking man, but his lines were so awful. Maybe it's an elaborate scheme they're running. Maybe he lures unsuspecting women away from downtown, and then the other two kill them. My hand flies to my mouth. Do you think that's possible? He holds up his hands and shakes his head. 
I think it's much more probable that he was just a guy with bad pickup lines. So let's continue. Why were you filming this video? Because I'm an influencer. I have to come up with good content, and anything that can get people to comment is good content. Charlie shifts in her seat beside me, and I know, without even looking at her, that she's rolling her eyes. Okay, I might come back to that. What happened after the video? I went to head back to the lodge, but that's when I realized I was in a corner of town I hadn't been before. It was dark, but there were street lights. I saw the woman on the ground, and then the guy stabbed her. I screamed, and that's when the killer yelled at his accomplice to get me. Then I ran. That's when I got all muddled because I have no idea how far I ran, but I knew I had shopped on Rodeo, so after making my way back there, I was able to return to the lodge. Okay, and what time was this? Well, I didn't check my watch. I was a little busy watching some poor girl get stabbed and running for my life. But it was after the Christmas tree lighting. We left her about 6.30, and she came to the room around 8.30, Charlie says. Detective Stanton nods and scribbles that down. Then he looks back at me. Can you tell me anything about the murderer or the victim? Um, the woman was blonde, I think. I don't have a clue about her height because she was sitting down. The killer had brown hair and either a beard or a stubble. I was too far away to see for sure. The one who ran after me also had brown hair and was a little chubby. I'm not a runner, but I managed to escape him. You would have been proud of me, Charlie. I flash her a smile, but she doesn't offer one back. Detective Stanton leans back in his chair and folds his hands on his rotund belly. So, brown hair and chubby? Is that all you have? I blink at the detective. Does he not understand how adrenaline works? Well, I was a little worried about getting stabbed, so pardon me for not stopping to take pictures. I could probably look at mug shots and pick them out. I'm afraid we need more than brown hair to be able to pull mug shots. Otherwise, you'd be looking for days. Okay, did you hear them argue? Say anything? Just when the killer yelled at his accomplice to get me, and that guy said, Hey, come back here. Detective Stanton does not look impressed. Look, I saw the man stab the woman. She screamed and bled, then I screamed and fled. I didn't mean to rhyme, but the words almost make me smile, until I remember how serious this is. Okay, well, Miss Duval, I'll certainly do what I can to find out more about this murder. I have to tell you, though, that this isn't much to go on. But I've given you all the information I can. Are you telling me that you won't give me police protection? I'm an easy target to find. I thought you were an influencer. Detective Stanton looks genuinely confused. I am. As an influencer, I post all the time. So there are videos of me everywhere, including at my other job as a cosmetologist. We're only here for the weekend, Belle, Charlie says, speaking up. I doubt you need police protection for two nights. Detective Stanton blinks at me as if he's trying to understand everything. Wait, you don't even live here? No, we live in Cooperville, Charlie says. We just came to check out the lodge and the tree lighting. Detective Stanton takes that information in. Then he leans back and shakes his head. Your friend is right. I don't think you'll have to worry about being found. You didn't get a good look at him, so the chances are slim that he got a good look at you, and even slimmer that he'll try to find you in this tourist town. Chances are much higher that he ran as soon as you saw him. Now we'll look into the area you detailed and see what we can find. Can you give me a number to reach you? I pull a card from my purse and slide it across the desk to him. So you aren't going to get me protection? What happens if he finds me tonight or tomorrow before we leave? Detective Stanton chuckles. This is a small town, Miss Duvall. There's not enough manpower to give you protection even if we wanted to. But again, I don't think you have anything to worry about. 
if you see anything else, you can call me here. Or you said you live in Cooperville, right? I nod as he rummages around in a drawer and pulls out a business card, which he hands to me. Then you can also call Jackson. He's a former cop who offers protection to people who need it. And he lives in Cooperville. Sounds like you might qualify. I lift my eyebrows at him. A washed-up cop? You think a washed-up cop can protect me? Anger flashes in Detective Stanton's eyes, and his voice takes on an icy edge. He's not washed up. Jackson was one of the best cops I knew. But even if he was, isn't a washed-up cop better than nothing? I'm not so sure of that, but Detective Stanton does not look like he's in the mood to argue. So I take the card and nod. What about the murder? I said I'll look into it, and I will. If something turns up, you'll be the first to know. I may not be hip to cop lingo, but I can pick out a dismissal a mile away. It is doubtful that Detective Stanton will look into this case, and even more doubtful that I'll ever hear anything from him. But I thank him for his time anyway. Well, that was a giant bust, I say to Charlie as we exit the police station. I wouldn't say that. You reported a crime, and he gave you two numbers to call if anything else happens. I'd consider that a win. Of course she would. It's not like it's her life on the line. If the murderer decides to come after me, two numbers aren't going to make a bit of difference. Chapter 5 Bell. I can't help jumping at every shadow as we head down to breakfast the next morning. The rest of the girls seem well-rested and refreshed, but they don't have to worry about a killer hunting them down, a killer who could be anywhere, even in this very lodge. Needless to say, I did not sleep well last night, and it took two layers of concealer to even make a dent on the dark circles digging trenches under my eyes. Belle, it's going to be fine, Katie says, falling into step beside me. Somehow she's managed to pick up on my mood and is now attempting to make me feel better. That's easy for you to say. You're not the one who witnessed a murder. I don't mean to snap at her, but that comes with lack of sleep for me. Snarkiness and circles. A great combination. Look, we check out tomorrow and go back to our normal life. I'm sure nothing will happen before then. Yeah, maybe. A door opens to my right and I scream and nearly jump into Katie's arms until I realize the girl in the doorway looks just as scared as I do. She's got a towel slung over her arm and is clearly heading to the hot tub or the pool, not trying to kill me, but I glance behind her just in case. She might not be the killer, but she might be harboring him. Belle, come on. Katie tugs on my arm as I stare into the woman's hotel room a little too long. People are going to report you for being creepy if you don't cut it out, she whispers. She's right. I know she's right because I would be reporting some crazy woman scoping out my room, but I can't seem to make myself stop. My stomach feels like one of those giant balls of rubber bands, and every time something unexpected happens, one of the bands breaks and ricochets around my stomach. I haven't felt like this since I auditioned for the part of Shelby in Steel Magnolias in high school, a role I didn't get even though I was the most Southern actor in the group. There are moments I still swallow a taste of bitterness at that memory. We get to the eating hall without further incident. I can't stand to call it a cafeteria because it reminds me too much of high school and slide into one of the bigger booths. I slide in last, so I'm sitting on the outside. Normally, this is because I have to use the bathroom more than the other girls, partly because I have to fix my makeup more than they do, and partly because I have a bladder the size of a hacky sack. But today, it's so I can make an escape if I have to. 
I don't know if I could actually leave my friends if push came to shove, but I want the option. Oh my gosh, everything on this menu looks amazing, but also calorie-laden, Charlie says, her tone a combination of longing and regret. We're on vacation, Charlie, Hannah says with a roll of her eyes. I think you cannot worry about the calories for today. Charlie sighs long and deep. That's not how it works. Vacation or not, every 3,500 calories equals another pound. Do you know how many calories are in the decadent custard orange vanilla brioche French toast? No, and I don't care. Piper cocks her head and taps her finger in the air for a few seconds. My guess would be about 950. 950? That's worse than I thought, Charlie says. That's half of my daily caloric needs. Well, we'll be ice skating and walking around town, Katie chimes in helpfully. That should burn some of those calories. I don't know if it's enough. There is a sadness to Charlie's tone as she shakes her head. And I wonder if she has to work hard to maintain her weight. She's always trying to get us to eat healthier, but I always thought she liked that kind of food. Maybe I've been wrong. The omelet is a healthier option for sure, Piper says, although they probably fry it in butter, so you'd have to ask for it to be done in Pam or something lighter. Oh my gosh, just get the French toast if that's what you want, Hannah snaps. It's not like you won't work it off when we get home. That's all you do is work out. That's not true, Charlie sputters. But her argument falls flat when the rest of us stare at her. Okay, maybe it's a little true. Fine, I'll order the French toast. You only live once, right? Unless there's a killer after you. I mutter under my breath. But no one at the table seems to hear me. Or if they do, they're ignoring me. The waitress arrives, a petite brunette whose hair is already spilling out of her ponytail, even though it's only breakfast, and takes our order. Charlie caves and gets the French toast. Piper and Katie both order some crepe thing. Hannah gets a stack of pancakes, and then the waitress is looking at me. Um, I'll have the eggs and bacon with sourdough toast. I hadn't really scanned the menu much, as my eyes have been continually darting around the room in search of the killer or his accomplice. And since I didn't get the best look, that includes every man with brown hair who enters the room. And how would you like your eggs? The waitress asks. What? Oh, scrambled. Like my brain, I think. Okay, I'll put this order in and be back in a minute. She leaves only to return a minute later with an urn of coffee, five mugs, and a basket of cream and sugar. Coffee is free, but let me know if you want anything other than that or water. Coffee's fine, thanks, Charlie says, grabbing a mug and pouring herself a cup. She passes on the cream and sugar, though I have no idea how she drinks it black. Black coffee is good for you, she has said, on more than one occasion. But not if you fill it with cream and sugar. I grab a mug and add cream until it turns a nice tan color. The health benefits mean little to me if you can't drink it, and black coffee just tastes like burnt water. The other girls also fill mugs and begin chatting about the schedule for today. Originally, we had all decided on ice skating first, but now Charlie wants to try snowboarding. Hannah wants to go skiing. Piper wants to stay in her room and work though we aren't going to let her, and Katie wants to tour the town. What about you, Belle? Katie asks. Um, I'm trying to stay engaged in the conversation, but a man with brown hair has just entered the eating area and is staring at me. I can't quite tell if he's the killer or not, but suddenly he's striding in our direction with a purposeful gait. There's no time to run, so I do the only thing I can think of at the moment. I crawl under the table. 
What are you doing, Belle? Hannah asks as I bump into her leg. Hush, he'll hear you. I don't know what I'm thinking exactly. The man has already seen me. So if he really is after me, hiding under the table isn't going to do much. Who will hear? Katie asks. The man coming right at us. I think he might be the killer. I shuffle closer to the wall, trying to ignore all the dirt and grime on the floor. I'll definitely have to wash my hands like three times before the food comes. I bump the table and hear Charlie growl. Belle, you just spilled our coffee. Get out from under the table now. Is he gone? Considering we don't know who you are talking about, we can't say, Charlie hisses. But people are starting to stare, so get out from under the table. I make my way back to the open edge of the table and peek out. The man is no longer striding our direction, so I wipe my hands on my pants and slide back into my seat, chagrined. What was that about? Charlie still sounds mad, and I'm sure the stain on her shirt has something to do with it. She must have had her coffee in hand and spilled it when I bumped the table, because it looks like she's dribbled down her shirt. I'll pay to have it cleaned or get her a new one. Charlie's style is definitely affordable. There was a guy and he locked eyes with me and started coming this direction. I thought for sure he was the killer. Didn't you get a good look at the killer? Hannah asks. No, she didn't. It's not often that I visualize steam coming out of Charlie's ears, but I certainly do today. Wait, I thought you were scared he saw you because you saw him. Katie is clearly confused, and little furrowed lines that I want to rub out crease her forehead. I did see him. He has brown hair and a beard, or at least stubble, I think. Although it could have been shadows, it was kind of far away for me to get a good look. Plus, there was adrenaline, and you know how it does funny things to you. I offer a hesitant smile to Charlie, knowing she'll understand the effects of adrenaline and hoping it will ease her anger. So, are you saying that any brown-haired man could be the killer? Hannah is not letting up on her line of questioning, and it is clear from her tone that she finds my logic ridiculous. Well, not every brown-haired man. He has to be taller than me, although he was bending over to stab the woman, so I'm not sure how tall he was, but lean. He might have had muscles, but definitely not bodybuilder style. His accomplice was chubbier, which is how I outran him, but that's about all I saw. Belle, that is ridiculous. You are literally describing half of the men at this lodge. You can't hide under tables every time one of them looks your direction. He wasn't just looking my direction. He was coming my direction. And he seemed very purposeful. It is obvious they don't understand my logic. But then again, they don't have a killer after them, so how can they? And do you see him now? Hannah asks, twisting to take in the room. Um... I tilt my head out and scan the area, and there, several tables away is the man, with another woman, whom he was probably walking toward and not me. Okay, yes, but I didn't know he was meeting some woman across the room. Oh my gosh, is it going to be like this all weekend? Charlie scowls at me. I don't think I can handle this if it is. I'm sure it won't, right, Belle? Katie shoots me a meaningful look that clearly says I should let this go, even though I can't. But maybe I can pretend. I swallow my fear and put on my bravest face. No, I'm sure it will be fine. Then we'll head home and forget all about this, I hope. Maybe you should talk to security, Katie says. I know they won't know what to look for, but maybe they can monitor you, 
and alert you if they see someone following you. At least then you wouldn't have to be jumping under tables. Yeah, maybe. But before I do anything else, I'm getting myself a better disguise. Chapter 6 Jackson Dogs are better than people. I've known this since I was five years old and got my first dog. He went everywhere with me and slept in my bed. Something I enjoyed at five, but enjoy a little less now at 28. Especially when I wake up to the hot odor of dog breath on my face in the morning. People say a dog's mouth is actually pretty clean, but I don't know how that can be possible with the stench that greets me every morning. Still, I'll take my yellow lab hogging my bed every day over dealing with people. People are messy and clingy and crazy. Unfortunately, my business requires that I deal with people on occasion. I'm sorry, you want me to do what? My brain is trying to make sense of the words coming out of the candy apple red mouth of the perky blonde sitting across from me, but it is proving difficult. It's not that her words themselves are hard to understand. After all, she's a trophy wife. Big hair, big chest, and an even bigger attitude. But not the biggest vocabulary. No, it's the meaning behind them that I'm having a hard time grasping. She flips her hair and sighs in exasperation. I want you to investigate my gardener. I'm fairly certain that he's having an affair with my maid, but I can't fire him until I'm sure, or else he'll sue me. I was already sued when I fired the mechanic for sleeping with the cook. My husband was not pleased, so I have to make sure this time. This is the problem with wealthy people. Money makes them stupid. It makes them say stupid things and do even stupider things. I honestly believe that too much money is linked to decreased brain function. And while I saw some of this when I was a cop, there have been many more examples since opening my own security firm. Why does it matter if your gardener is seeing your maid? The woman across from me, who introduced herself as Bambi, and no, I'm not kidding, doesn't strike me as a conservative Bible thumper. Not if her too tight shirt with a very revealing neckline says anything about her. So I doubt this is really about a relationship. At least, not one between the gardener and the maid. It matters because it's happening behind my back. Do you know the laughing stock I will become if people find out that the help is having affairs without my knowledge? Her hands flare out in wild gestures, and her voice rises at the end, as if this is the worst thing that could happen, as if something happening without her consent is the end of humanity as we know it. But maybe in her world it is. Maybe in a world of mansions and servants, things like reality matter less. So the end game here is firing the gardener? She scoffs and rolls her eyes. Well, only if it's actually happening. I don't want him fired if these claims turn out to be unfounded. He's a fantastic gardener. Uh-huh. I can't even imagine having so much money that I would hire someone to spy on my help. But taking her case would be easy money for me, although not why I got into the protection business. You do realize that I'm not a private investigator, right? I'm more like a bodyguard for hire. What's the difference? She asks, waving her manicured hand around. Her nails aren't overly long like some women I've seen, but they are immaculately painted to the same color as her lips. I doubt they see hard work. And a part of me wonders if she changes her nail color to match her lips or vice versa. The difference is pretty big. One is digging up dirt on someone, and the other is making sure someone stays alive. She lets out another exasperated sigh, this one louder than the last, and folds her arms across her ample chest. But you used to be a cop, right? Yeah, but I had access to databases when I was a cop, 
that allowed me to run background checks and other reports. And I never followed people around trying to catch them in compromising situations as a cop. So pretend that I need protection. I probably will if I have to fire him. Roman has a bit of a temper. I run a hand across my forehead. I'm tempted to take the job, mainly because I don't think Bambi will take no for an answer, and I could use the money. But I'm not a photographer, and the idea of hanging out waiting to take pictures of someone makes my skin crawl. Let me check my schedule and get back to you. There is no schedule, of course, but she doesn't know that. I stand, hoping she'll take the hint and follow suit. You mean you can't tell me if you can do the job today? She appears flustered, but she does stand and follow me to the door. Well, I'm just finishing up a job. I need to make sure I would have the necessary time to devote to a job like yours. I don't give anything less than 100%. I'm laying the flattery on a little thick, but I have the feeling it's the only way I'm going to get Bambi out of my office. It's too bad she couldn't be as skittish as the creature she's named after. And I appreciate that, but I do need to know as soon as possible. When do you think you might have an answer for me? She's in the doorway now, but as if recognizing my play, she's gripped onto the doorframe like it's a preserver in the ocean. I should have a better answer tomorrow night. I'll be dreading making that phone call all day, but it's bound to be easier to tell her no over the phone than in person. Tomorrow night? Can't you tell me in the morning? I open my mouth to give her another lame excuse, but I am blissfully saved by the ringing of the phone. Sorry, duty calls. I'll let you know tomorrow. And then, somehow, I manage to get her hands off the doorframe and shut the door on her flabbergasted face. Powers Protection Agency, I say, picking up the phone. Jackson, it's Stanton. I may have a job for you. Chapter 7 Bell. Though I wanted to go shopping for a disguise first, the girls don't let me and drag me instead to the ice skating rink. It's been forever since I've been skating, and I want to enjoy it, but I can't help watching every guy who comes close and wondering if he's the killer and if he'll just pull a knife and stab me here on the rink. Will you please pay attention? Charlie asks as I bump into her for the second time. I'm sorry, that guy over there looks a little like the murderer. I point across the rink. The one with the red stocking cap covering his hair that you can't see? I see her point, but it's a feeling more than anything. His face is hard, like the murderer's. You can barely see his face from here, Charlie says, shaking her head at me. Plus, there's no way some guy is going to try and kill you here. There are too many people. Now, can you please try to have fun? With that, she skates away from me, still shaking her head. Right. Fun. Something I'm very good at normally. But in this case, a hand clamps down on my shoulder and I scream, whirl, and punch someone right in the nose. I'm actually kind of impressed I landed the punch, even though it didn't feel very hard. Ow, what was that for? The man asks, his voice nasally as he holds his hand over his nose. Still, it's enough for me to recognize him. You, why are you following me? Are you a part of this? Did you use those corny lines to drive me outside and right to the killer? Are you here to finish the job? My voice rises steadily with each question, and people around us stop and stare. But I don't care. The man looking at me with wide and slightly concerned eyes is the same one from the night before. The last person I talked to before I wandered into a murder scene. What are you talking about? He glances around, clearly embarrassed by the attention. 
I'm sorry the lines were corny. I just thought you were pretty and wanted to talk to you. When I saw you here, I thought I'd come and apologize. But I retract my apology. You've got crazy written all over you, and I don't have time for that. Yeah, well, I don't have time for accomplices. I holler after him as he skates away. Okay, that's enough of a scene, Katie says, appearing at my side. How about you and I go get some hot chocolate? We have to find him, Katie. Otherwise, I'm going to be jumping at shadows forever, I say as she leads me off the ice. It won't be forever. We'll be back home tomorrow, and then you won't have to worry. I sure hope so. We trade in our skates and head over to the chocolate village. It's teeming with kids, but maybe that's safer. Surely, the killer won't be here. We manage to order some hot cocoa and find a seat. And that's when I see him. Not the killer, but the accomplice. And suddenly, the urge to confront him builds within me, and I'm bounding from the bench and heading toward him. Belle, what are you doing? I hear Katie behind me, but I don't slow down. When I reach the accomplice, he is standing near a giant fountain spewing chocolate, but his back is to me. Hey, I'll have you know I've told the police what I saw, and I'm calling them right now to come and get you. The man turns, and before I can register that it's actually not the accomplice, I poke him in the chest, which evidently catches him off guard because his arms pinwheel in slow motion before he falls backward into the chocolate fountain. Belle, what on earth? Katie asks as she arrives beside me. I'm so sorry, I say to the man, as he sputters and tries to climb from the fountain. I turn to Katie, my face red and hot. I thought he was the accomplice. I should report you to the police, the man says, wiping chocolate from his face. She's very sorry. Katie grabs my arm and pulls me behind her as if she thinks the man will reach out and punch me. She might be right. He looks pretty mad. She thinks she saw a murder and it has her on edge. Please don't call the cops. We're going and we'll be leaving Rudolph tomorrow. Good riddance, he says, shaking off more chocolate. Then he points a finger at me. I better not see you again. He walks away, leaving chocolatey footprints as he goes. Okay, how about you and I go enjoy a nice spa treatment at the hotel, away from any men? Katie pulls out her phone and shoots a text off to the other girls, letting them know our plans. I'm really sorry. He looked so much like the accomplice, the guy who chased me. I thought I got a better look at him. Katie slings an arm around my shoulders as she leads me back to the lodge. It's okay. I'm sure when we get back home, all of this will go away and just seem like a very bad memory. I certainly hope so, though I'm beginning to doubt I will ever feel normal again. When we get back to the lodge, Katie leads the way to the spa, signs me up for a massage and facial, and then sits down with me to wait. Aren't you going to get one too? I ask. No, I don't want to take the chance that you get done first and accost another innocent patron. So I'm going to sit right here and make sure you enter and exit safely. I didn't accost anyone. I don't think. Did I? Katie sighs. Accost is another word for attack, Belle. And yeah, you did so I'm going to ensure it doesn't happen again. But that's not fair to you. I can't believe how great of a friend Katie is being, but it does make me feel guilty knowing she'll just be sitting outside. Don't you worry about me. I've got a book on my phone I've been dying to finish reading. This gives me the perfect time to do it. Reading a book instead of getting a massage does not sound like a good trade-off to me, but I do appreciate Katie's offer. Thanks. A few minutes later, a large woman steps out of the door and calls my name. Her arms are massive and strain her white shirt. 
The name Greta is stitched on it in blue. Though I'm a little afraid she'll break me during the massage, I'm also a little relieved. She looks like she could take anyone on, and though I don't know if she would protect me, she'll make a good shield if push comes to shove. Undress to your comfort level and leave your clothes there. She points to the single chair in the room. I'll be back in five minutes. I nod. Wait until she's gone and then quickly strip down. I never know how long it will take me, and I'm always terrified that the masseuse will walk back in before I'm ready. Greta has the decency to knock, and by the time she does, I am completely under the blanket. She turns down the lights and puts on some relaxing music. But then, just before she starts the massage, she cracks her knuckles. The sound is deafening, like I imagine a gunshot would sound, and every muscle in my body tenses. However, as she begins to work on my muscles, I feel the tension slip away. Maybe Detective Stanton is right. Maybe the killer left town as soon as he realized someone saw him. Maybe I've been jumping at shadows for no reason. Maybe I can just relax and enjoy the rest of today. After all, we have to leave tomorrow, and then everything will be okay. The hour with Greta flies by, and when she's done, she has me flip over, and a petite woman comes in to do the facial. As she places cool slices of cucumbers on my eyes, I can feel the last of the stress melting away. You look a hundred times more relaxed, Katie says when I emerge from the spa. I feel a hundred times better. In fact, I think I'd like to do some more shopping. All right, let's get some money from the room and go shopping. Katie smiles and slings an arm around my shoulder, and together we head toward the elevator. I reach into my pocket for the room key as soon as we step off the elevator, but it's not there. I dig into the other pocket in case I put it in the wrong one, although I always put the key in my left pocket and my phone in my right. But the key isn't there either. Suddenly, all the anxiety and fear that had floated away comes crashing back like a riptide trying to pull me under. Katie, I think someone stole my key. That's not possible, Belle. When would they have had an opportunity to steal your key? I don't know. I think back over the morning. I remember grabbing the key before we went down for breakfast, but I didn't have to use it after that. It could have been anywhere. The rank, the chocolate village, or... My eyes widen. Do you think the employees could be in on it? What are you talking about? Katie fishes her own key out and opens the hotel room door. Greta! or the woman who came in after her. My clothes were on a chair and my eyes were closed a lot of the time. One of them could have easily snagged my key. Maybe they're meeting with the killer as we speak to give him my key. We should probably just check out now. We are not going to check out now. Charlie would never let you hear the end of it. While the thought of Charlie ragging on me forever is unpleasant, the thought of being stabbed in my sleep is worse. I don't care if Charlie gives me a hard time. Better that than dead. I turn to exit the room, but Katie stops me. Belle, is this your card? I look up to see her holding my key card. The one I either left on the table or someone stole and then planted back here. I don't know which answer is correct, but what I do know is that I feel like I'm losing my mind. Chapter 8 Belle I wish we could have stayed longer, Hannah says when we get back to the apartment. That was gorgeous. I wouldn't mind going back too, but not until Belle stops acting crazy. I still can't believe you knocked some poor guy into a fountain. Charlie shakes her head as she grabs her bag from the trunk. I didn't mean to. I grab my bag and pause a moment before asking the next question. Do you guys think there's any chance the killer could find me here? No way, 
Even if the guy did see you, he doesn't know who you are, nor will he know where you live or how to find you. Hannah throws her bag over her shoulder and heads for the stairs. Always the voice of reason, that one. Except that I'm everywhere online. I follow her up the stairs, pulling my phone out and loading one of my social media apps. I'm a celebrity, remember? Charlie comes up behind me. You're an influencer, not a celebrity. They are not the same things. Hannah opens the door and we step inside. I drop my bag on the floor and sink into the couch. Close enough in this case. I post all the time and I'm sure there are pictures of me in front of backgrounds they could use to find me. My heart begins speeding up as I think back on all the pictures I've taken. As an influencer, it's important that people connect with me. So there are a lot of pictures and videos where I've probably shared too much. Suddenly, all the warnings from teachers in high school and college about posting flood back into my mind. But I never thought it could happen to me. I think you just need to relax. I doubt anyone is going to come after you. Katie pulls the front door shut. The others mumble their assent. But before they all disperse, my phone rings and the room stills. I glance down at the caller ID, but unknown caller is all that stares back at me. Should I answer it? My voice trembles with fear. The girls, who had all been very certain I had nothing to fear, now stare at me with wide eyes. I decide that not knowing will plague me far more than knowing for sure. At least if I know it's the killer, I can take it to the police. Maybe they can trace the number. That's what they do on TV, right? Hello? My voice is soft and shaky, but it's loud enough. Hello? Is someone there? I give it a few more seconds and then the call goes dead. Who was it? Hannah asks. They never said anything. The call just went dead. It has to be the killer. He's found me already. I don't think that's possible, Piper says, though for once she doesn't sound sure. Well, I don't know who else it could have been. It could have been any number of people. Telemarketers, for one. Charlie plops down in the rocker recliner. I get them all the time. Or a wrong number, Hannah offers. A wrong number? A day and a half after I witnessed a murder? Popper, what are the odds of that happening? Piper shakes her head. I'm not sure that is something I can calculate. I'd have to find all the instances where someone witnessed a murder and posted about it. Then I would have to cross-reference their phone records, which I don't have access to. I'm not sure I can give you that information reliably. It doesn't matter, I say throwing my hands in the air. The odds are astronomical, which means that the killer is out to get me. But none of your fans have ever sent anything here, Hannah says pragmatically. So unless we were followed, I don't see how anyone could know where you live. We weren't followed, were we? She glances around at the others. I don't think so. I chew on my lip as I think back but I wasn't really watching. No, we weren't followed, Charlie says. It's just an odd coincidence. Okay, if you guys are sure. They all nod, though I swear a bit of fear lingers in their eyes. If anything else happens, though, I'm going to get a hotel. I would never forgive myself if something happened to any of you. Nothing is going to happen to any of us, Katie says. The police know about the murder. They'll be looking for the perpetrator. And didn't the detective give you a number for a bodyguard here in Cooperville? He did, and I think I might call him. I pat my pockets, wondering where I put the card for the bodyguard. Just to go with me on my secret Santa stops. Although, I might have him come with me to work a few times, just to make sure it's safe. Good. Do that. Do whatever it takes to stop obsessing over this. Charlie grabs her bag and heads to her room. 
The other girls follow suit, but I keep thinking about the trip home. Were we followed? I don't think so, but I wasn't really paying attention to the road. I was focused on getting out of there. I will have to be more careful when I go out now, and tomorrow I should get a disguise. None of my clothes will work. They're all too bright. Everyone says black is slimming, but it's so boring. However, until this murderer is caught, boring may have to suffice. Chapter 9. Bell. The next morning dawns too early for me. Well, it's probably the normal time, but since I spent most of the night tossing and turning, it feels way too early. And the bags under my eyes now look like permanent craters. I stumble into the kitchen to make some coffee, but Charlie is already there. I swear that girl must get up at the crack of dawn. Good morning. I guess you have an early morning workout planned. Charlie takes a sip of her coffee and nods. Yep, need to make up for the last two days. What are you doing up so early? I'm going to call that Jackson Powers guy about getting protection, and then I'm going shopping for a disguise. Charlie shakes her head. Do you really think you need a disguise? It was just a phone call, Belle. A phantom phone call? I grab a mug and fill it with coffee and some peppermint mocha creamer. Peppermint mocha is my favorite creamer and just another reason that I love Christmas. I seriously wish they sold it year-round or that I could buy enough to make it last the whole year. But I make do with other flavors the rest of the year. You don't know that it was a phantom phone call. I really think you're making more out of this than you need to. That's because you're not the one who saw the murder. I grab a bowl, fill it with cereal and milk, and then take it to the table. Cereal isn't always filling, but it's an easy breakfast. And since I don't cook much, it's a good one for me. I wish I had been. Charlie mumbles under her breath. Then she scoots back from the table and takes her dishes to the sink, before flashing a wave and heading out the door. I wish she had been too, because Charlie would have known what to do. She probably wouldn't have run. Instead, she would have confronted them, or at least gotten a better look at them. But it wasn't Charlie who saw them, it was me. And that means I have to be the one to worry. When breakfast is finished, I grab my coat, hat, and sunglasses in preparation for some shopping. I open the front door slowly. Charlie left less than 10 minutes ago, but that's plenty of time for the killer to have snuck up our stairs. No one appears to be on the landing as I peek through the crack, so I open the door a little wider. Nothing, but that doesn't slow down the erratic beating of my heart. Stepping outside, I scan the area before locking the door behind me. The air feels even colder today than it did yesterday, and I pull my coat a little tighter around me as I make my way down the stairs. It's not snowing, but it feels cold enough that it could. I scan the area and the parking lot before hurrying to my car. It takes my car a moment to warm up, and as I sit in the seat with the heat blaring, a chill races down my spine. Is someone watching me? I peer out the window, but nothing moves. Still, the feeling does not subside, and I decide the car is warm enough. It's time to get a disguise and a bodyguard. When I reach the downtown area, I park and then fish the card out of my pocket for Jackson Powers and punch his number in my phone. It's a little early, but maybe he'll be open and able to see me today. Powers Protection Agency, can I help you? The voice on the other end is not how I imagined Jackson would sound. Jackson is a strong name, solid. And while I can't see the guy on the other end of the line, his voice does not sound strong and solid to me. Yes, hi, my name is Belle Duvall. I was given your card by Detective Stanton over in Rudolph. I need to see about hiring protection. Do you have time today, say, in about an hour? 
I've never shopped so quickly, but this is an emergency. Yes, he can see you then. I'll let him know. Thank you. Ah, that explains it. The man who answered the phone is not Jackson, though it is unusual for a company to have a male receptionist. Plus, they're able to see me without issue. Does that mean they're terrible? Or just that business is slower around Christmas? People are generally nicer this time of the year. Well, except for the ones plunging knives into women's chests, or the ones yelling at innocent women trying to film a video. After scanning the area to make sure no predators are lurking, I step out of the car and head for the costume shop. It's been ages since I've been inside it, but they're bound to have something that will work. Unfortunately, the door is locked, and the sign declares they open at 9. I rub my hands together to warm them and check the time on my phone. 8.45. Only 15 minutes to go. I can make it that long. Suddenly, I hear the clicking of a lock, and the door opens. Dear, you look like you're freezing. Do you want to come inside? The woman addressing me is dressed like Mrs. Claus, complete with a wig. At least, I think it's a wig. And a hat. Oh, yes, thank you. I know you don't open for another 15 minutes, but can I look around? Of course, dear. I'll just finish opening and then I'll be able to help you as soon as you're ready. I watch as the woman scurries away. She certainly doesn't move like an older woman. And at closer inspection, the lines on her face look more penciled in than permanent. Plus, I think I saw just a bit of blonde hair poking out from the gray wig. I decide she's definitely wearing a costume, but I can't help wondering if she chooses to or if it's a required part of the dress code. And if it is, does she have to wear the same character every day or can she change characters? Realizing I'm not going to get the answers to those questions now, I turn to the rest of the store looking for where to start. The store seems to be organized by light and fluffy costumes like clowns, princesses, and ballerinas on one side, and darker costumes like devils, ghouls, and Freddy Krueger on the other side. Though I would never venture to that side normally, I head toward the darker section. I don't watch scary movies, at least not anymore. There was one night in high school that we had a slumber party, and decided to have a scary movie marathon. Only the other girls crashed out a little after midnight, and I was up all night listening to the sounds of the house. It was Charlie's, and not mine, so I wasn't used to the noises. And I grew convinced that something was growing inside her cabinets that would escape and attack me, so I didn't sleep a wink. After that, I had nightmares for a week, and decided scary movies were not my forte. Weird how I ended up starring in my own real-life one. Most of the outfits in this section won't work, but I do manage to find a black trench coat that should. It's not very warm, but if I get it big enough, I can dress in layers underneath it. I sling it over my arm and keep looking. On the accessory wall, I find a pair of big, dark sunglasses and a black wig. Unfortunately, it's a Morticia Adams wig, so it's longer than I would like. But I can always cut it, so it will work for now. I take my items to the front desk, and Mrs. Claus looks up at me and smiles. Are you having a nightmare before Christmas party? Or just deciding to go a little dark this Christmas? Neither. I'm using them for a disguise so the killer won't find me. I snap my mouth closed realizing too late that I probably shouldn't go around telling strangers what I saw. But she's so sweet that I didn't even think about it. Still, Mrs. Claus could pass on the information to the killer unknowingly if he comes looking for me. Or she could even be working with the killer and trying to find out if anyone saw him. Oh man, I hope that's not the case, because if it is, then this whole disguise is for nothing. Stupid Belle. You'll have to be more careful. Mrs. Claus raises an eyebrow. A killer? Here in our town? I try to play it off, hoping she'll think I'm just some confused kook. 
No, not here. A few towns over. But it was rather dark, so I suppose I could have seen something else. Doesn't hurt to be careful, though, right? She nods, and a thoughtful expression crosses her face. You know, there was a killer in our town years ago. Well, not in Cooperville, per se. I think it was over in Rudolph. Evidently, he hunted a lot in the resort towns because tourists were easy prey. She looks up at me with wide eyes. I mean, they were back then. I'm sure that's not the case anymore. We don't have a lot of crime here in Cooperville or Rudolph. There was a serial killer here before? How have I never heard that? I will have to ask Piper to help me look into this killer when I get back to the room. Yes, I don't remember his name. It was years ago, but I'm sure you're perfectly safe now. Yeah, you're probably right. I'll still get the items, though. I offer a pinched smile. Maybe I will organize a costume party for Christmas. That would be fun. It would. I love dressing up. Her smile is genuine as her eyes sparkle and dance. Do you pick a new character every day? I ask as she rings me up. Heavens no, that would be a little much. But I generally change them up every few days. I play so many different people that sometimes I forget who I am. I wish I could do that, forget who I am. Or rather, I wish I could make someone else forget who I am. Do you have a mirror I can use to put the wig on? I'd like to see how it looks. Of course, over on that wall. She points to the left, and I take my purchases over to the wall. Pulling a hair tie from my pocket, I always carry one just in case, I twist my hair up and secure it into a ponytail. Then I pull on the wig and tuck the stray strands underneath. The wig is definitely too long. It looks like a wig but it will do until I can cut it. Then I put on the glasses and the coat. It's not quite natural looking, but I certainly don't recognize me. Wow, that's a big change, Mrs. Claus says, appearing behind me. This is great, thank you. It's almost perfect. Now I just need a black sweater and some pants. After leaving the costume shop, I head to the clothing store and quickly grab what I'm looking for. Thankfully, the woman lets me change in the dressing room so that when I exit her store, I am clad entirely in black from head to toe. I check my phone. 9.50. This really is the fastest I have shopped in my life. Chapter 10. Jackson. She's late. I hate it when people are late because it messes with the rest of my schedule. Well... It would, if I were busy. Right now, the only things on my to-do list are this meeting and figuring out what to do once the agency goes under, because I can't make it last much longer. I can only hope this job will be more promising than Bambi's offer. I still haven't called her back yet. But somehow I doubt it. If the woman is already late, it probably means she feels entitled. And those are the worst ones. The door flies open, and a petite woman with dark hair hurries inside. Before closing the door, she glances behind her, as if she fears someone is following her. Then she flips up the collar of her black trench coat and slithers into the room. I have to mash my lips together to keep from laughing at her comical appearance. The woman is literally dressed like every stereotype of someone on the run, not only is her trench coat black, but so is her shirt, her pants, the scarf around her neck, and the oversized sunglasses dwarfing her face. If only she knew how much attention she was drawing to herself by trying to blend in. Jackson Powers, she asks as she sinks into the seat. At your service, you must be Miss Duval. I am. She glances behind her as if she's heard something. She's certainly skittish. Is this building secure, or do you think I could have been followed? Did you see someone following you? No, but this is my first time on the run. 
I'm not sure I'm that good at it yet. That much is obvious, but I keep my opinions to myself. Insulting her won't do anything to help me get the job, and I need this job. Dave told me you were looking for protection, so what can I do for you? She lowers her glasses, and then her mouth falls open. You? Why does it have to be you? It takes me a moment, probably because of the dark wig, but suddenly I realize she is the egotistical influencer from Friday night at the tree lighting in Rudolph. What was her name again? Oh, yes, Belle, like the Disney character, only not quite as nice. Ah, the self-important influencer. What's with the wig? Paparazzi after you? I wish. No, I witnessed a murder. And now I'm fairly certain the killer is after me. I'm sorry, what? She sighs, as if annoyed that she is having to do this. But she spills the story. Friday night, after the tree lighting, I wandered into a darker part of town, and some guy stabbed some girl. I screamed, got chased, made it back to the lodge alive, barely, I might add, she says, pointing a finger at me. Then I reported the crime to the police department. Your friend, Detective Stanton, seemed to think you could offer me protection. This is the woman Stanton called me about? I'll have some words for him later. He could have at least warned me she was a nut job. I rub my chin, the stiff stubble making a scratching noise beneath my fingers. Shaving was important when I was a police officer, but it is less important now. Is there a reason you think this killer is after you? You mean besides the fact that I saw him kill a woman and he saw me? The sass in her tone is almost comical. Yes, besides that. I'm fairly certain they called me last night. My roommates were telling me how I had nothing to worry about now that we're back here instead of in Rudolph, and then my phone rang, but no one was there. Are you able to trace phone calls? No, that's police jurisdiction. I can only provide protection. May I ask, though, how do you know the phone call was from the murderer if he didn't say anything? She rolls her eyes like this is the stupidest question anyone has ever asked her. Because I never get calls like that. When my phone rings, people want to talk to me. I'm afraid to ask, but I have to. And why is that? Because I'm an influencer. Duh. If someone is calling me, it's because they want me to rep something for them. Or they have a question about one of my videos. Right. An influencer. I knew this and I have no doubt she'll share other traits with them, like never having held a real job or doing meaningful work. Most of the influencers I've met have been like Stacy, trust fund kids who grew up with too much money and too little sense. Still, a phone call isn't much to get excited about. Okay, but wrong numbers do happen. Do you have any other reason to think the murderer is after you? She sighs again and rolls her eyes. Because I saw him kill someone? They don't just let you walk away when you've seen them kill someone. Don't you watch TV? Not cop shows. They don't generally get them right in my experience. But I do like cooking shows. My sarcasm is lost on her as Belle folds her arms across her chest and pushes her bottom lip out in a small pout. It's clearly a look she spent time perfecting in front of a mirror, though it does little for me. I came to you for help, not to be made fun of. If you don't think you can protect me, then I can find someone who hasn't been kicked off the force. My blood heats up at those words and I have to clench my fists together to keep from pounding them on the desk. I was not kicked off the force. I was forced into an early retirement. Whatever you say, my only concern is whether you can protect me or not. Although I have no doubt I can protect her, I'm not sure I want to take this case. Belle is asking for protection. 
unlike the last woman who was in here. But she also seems like the stereotypical rich snob, who will probably make my life a living nightmare for as long as she feels the need to be protected. But I do need the money. That rent bill isn't going to pay itself, nor is the electric bill covering both this place and my house. And at least this would be better than following the gardener and the maid. How did my life come to this? Yes, I can protect you, but it won't be cheap. Money is no object, Belle says. My social media accounts pay me well. Now, how does this work? I'm still staying at my place, though if anything else goes wrong, I'll probably go to a hotel. I don't want to endanger my roommates. It's not a huge apartment, so there's not really room for you inside, and it's the middle of winter, so I suppose sleeping outside wouldn't work. Not that there's much room there anyway. I almost laugh out loud at her suggestion. Sleep outside her apartment? Like in the entryway or landing? She really is a novice to all of this. With a soft sigh, I detail how the protection works. I will not be sleeping outside your apartment, Miss Duval, but I will escort you anywhere you need to go. It's Belle. I'm sorry, what? My name. You called me Miss Duval, but that makes me sound like my mom and really old. So can you please just call me Belle? Fine, Belle. Now, while I work up the contract, can you tell me anything about the killer that might help me spot him should he appear? Well, I already told you he has brown hair and stubble or a beard. It was hard to see. Okay, but that's half the men in town. Can you give me anything else? Anything that might narrow the pool of suspects down? She taps her lips. He was youngish. I mean, I didn't see any gray, and he moved quickly, so probably under 40. Her words almost make me laugh. She says 40 like it's ancient, like people stop being able to move when they're over the hill. Determining someone's age is clearly not her forte, nor are general descriptions come to think of it, because these aren't going to help at all. Okay. That narrows it down a little more. How about physical build or height? Well, he was crouching down, so I couldn't really see his height. Maybe if you crouched down, I could determine if he was bigger or smaller than you. No, that's fine. Body proportions aren't her strong suit either. The man could have longer legs or a longer torso. Was he a thinner man? Fatter? Um, he was probably wearing a coat, but he didn't seem that big, so I'd say on the thinner side. His accomplice was larger, which is probably the only reason I outran him. Are you sure you can't find the killer? That would make this all easier. I'm afraid that has to be left to the police. Detective Stanton is a good guy. I'm sure he's doing all he can. Might I offer one more suggestion, though? What's that? She folds her arms across her chest and lifts her chin, her posture screaming that she will probably ignore any suggestion I make, but I have to try. Maybe cut back on the disguise? You're so over the top that you're drawing attention to yourself. Honestly, if you wear a ball cap and some baggier clothes, you won't look much like the woman I met Friday night. Her nose wrinkles in disgust. You want me to dress like a bag lady? No, not a bag lady, just baggier clothes. Think sweats and sweatshirts, something out of the ordinary for you. I don't honestly know those are out of the ordinary for this woman, but I'd bet a month's salary that there's not a pair of sweats in her closet. At least not ordinary ones. She might have one of the designer kinds with the word juicy stamped on the derriere. I don't own sweats. Yeah, color me surprised. Well, I'm pretty sure you didn't own a black wig or a trench coat before you came here either. I'm not even sure where she picked them up. Maybe the costume shop in town? Maybe she raided a friend's Halloween closet. 
Look, there's a ton of sweats and baggy sweaters in the clothing shops. Grab a pair and wear those with a hat, and I promise you'll be almost unrecognizable. I'll consider it. Thank you. Now, can we start this today? I have some Christmas things to take care of, and I don't feel safe doing them without protection, especially when I can't wear the disguise. Yay, shopping, I mumble under my breath. What was that? Her voice is laden with daggers. Nothing. I was just saying that shouldn't be a problem. Let me just print out the contract here. Without waiting for a response from her, I turn to my computer to finish the contract. You said you'll need me today? From what time to what time? From noon to... I don't know when. Do we have to put an end time on it, or can you just keep track of the hours and bill me after? We can leave the end time blank, but I'm trying to get an idea of how many hours you'll need me a day to give you an estimate. I told you money is no object. I don't know how long I'll need you each day. Definitely whenever I need to go out. Okay, I'm going to put 10 hours a day for the estimate. You'll pay half now and half at the end, but the final bill will reflect actual worked hours. That's fine. Now, how long will it take you to reach me at my apartment? Like, if I need to go to the grocery store, how long would it take you to get to me? I live in town, so it won't take very long. Fifteen to twenty minutes. I will give you my cell number, and you can call me whenever you want a bodyguard. Twenty minutes? That seems like an awfully long time. I saw the man kill someone in less than twenty minutes. It's standard time. I hit print and listen to the blissful sound of the laser jet printer. Then I hand the papers across the desk to Belle to read and sign. She skims them, scribbles her name at the bottom, and pulls out a wad of cash. I expect you to be at my apartment by 11.30 so you can escort me on my errand. I grip my teeth to keep from lashing out at her and nod. Of course. I have your address here, so I'll be there. Good. She lets out one more huff and then disappears from my office. As soon as I know she's gone, I pick up the phone and dial Gary Stanton. Stanton, I say when he answers, why didn't you tell me the woman you were sending my way was crazy? I don't know that she is, he replies. Did you find the murder spot? Not exactly. I found the place I think she was describing, but there was nothing there. Because she's crazy. Look, this woman is probably just looking for attention. Likes on a video or something. Maybe, but she seemed convinced she saw something. Anyway, I sent the crime lab out so they'll look into it. I'll let you know if I find anything. I take it she came to see you? Yeah, she just left. I glance down at my watch. I'll be heading out in a minute to escort her on an errand. Probably shopping. Well, keep an eye on her. She didn't strike me as crazy. Riled up for sure, but not crazy. I'm not sure I agree with his assessment, but the contract staring up at me reminds me that it is my job to watch out for her, regardless of how I feel about her. At least it should keep me busy. I suppose I should be careful what I ask for in the future. Chapter 11 Bell. Though I cannot see them, I swear I can feel someone watching me as I leave Jackson's office. I glance around and pull my collar a little taller. There is no movement, but I know they're there. Quickening my pace, I hurry to the car, hitting the unlock button on my fob as I do. I slide into the car, locking the doors as soon as they're closed. Then I glance around once more before starting the car and pulling out of the lot. I am annoyed at Jackson's dismissal of my disguise, but I take his advice and stop by a shop on the way back to my apartment. Normally, I wouldn't be caught dead in sweats, but I have to admit, they have a few cute ones. I grab a black and white checkered set that says Polar Bear, along with a red and black one that says Team Santa. Then, for good measure, I grab a pink set 
with a giant snowflake on the sweatshirt. At least I look good in pink. Well, someone is going to be warm and stylish, the woman behind the counter says as she rings me up. I give her a tight smile as I hand over the cash. For once, I don't really care about being warm and stylish. I just want to be alive. Thanks. Purchases in hand, I head back to my car. But even with the disguise, my eyes jump at every person who gives me a second glance. Hopefully, I'll feel better with Jackson guarding me. There's no way I'm foregoing my normal Christmas routine. Although, I never did ask how he plans to protect me. Does he have a gun? A knife? Is he a master at hand-to-hand combat? Probably questions I should have asked before forking over a small fortune, but it's too late now. My eyes dart between the road and the mirrors as I continue toward home. The snow is back, and the fluffy white flakes make it hard to monitor the cars behind me. Suddenly, a black car appears in my mirror, and a cold sensation grips my heart. Are they following me? I take a sudden right turn, and the car continues past. Maybe they weren't following me after all, but it's better to be safe than sorry. I continue a little further down this road to make sure the car doesn't turn around and come back. When I'm convinced the car has gone, I turn back toward home. A small dusting of snow covers the ground as I pull into the parking lot, and I park in what I hope is an actual spot. I hate it when cars take up more than one spot, but it is hard to see the lines currently, so it's not really my fault if I'm crooked. I turn off the engine and glance around one more time before grabbing my phone for an update. My followers were promised more videos of Rudolph, but I did not deliver. And I need to explain why. I tap the record button and wait for it to start counting. Hey guys, I'm so sorry that I didn't get more videos up the last few days, but I guess I can post this now. The other night, I witnessed a crime. I'm not going to tell you what crime in case the perpetrator is watching this, but I'm taking precautions. I just had a close scare, though. I thought a car was following me, but if they were, I managed to shake them. Listen to me. Shake them like I'm some sort of detective. Anyway, I just wanted to let you all know that I'm okay, and I will keep posting. Thank you for the kind words that you guys have left me. If nothing else, I guess this makes good content. Still, I hope this won't last too much longer. Hit me up with questions or well wishes or whatnot, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. I smile and wave and then end the recording. After another glance around, I exit the car and make my way to the front door, keeping my ears open for any sound that might be out of place. It's surreally silent with the snow softly falling and no other noises. There are footprints leading to the building, but they stop at the stairs due to the roof covering that extends about a foot from the building, so I have no idea if someone has been up them recently or not. I keep close to the wall as I climb them, and I position my keys like a makeshift knife in between my fingers, like my older brother once showed me. I think he was secretly afraid someone would attack me as I walked across my college campus in the dark, and until now I'd considered the training useless, but I'm certainly glad for the knowledge at the moment. No one has attacked me by the time I reach our door, and my heart slowly returns to its normal rhythm. But when I grab the handle and the door opens, it quickly shoots back up again. It's unlocked? I could have sworn I locked it behind me when I left. Maybe one of the girls unlocked it. But why would they do that? We always keep the door locked. Does that mean someone has been here or could still be here? What if they hurt Katie or Hannah or Piper? I consider returning to my car and waiting until Jackson shows up. But before I can do that, noise carries out from inside the apartment. Though my heart races, I push the door open, 
crouching as I do in case someone with a gun is waiting on the other side. Belle, what on earth are you doing? I straighten at the sound of Piper's voice. Popper, is everything okay? Of course it is. What is wrong with you? My eyes dart around the room. The front door was unlocked. I thought they'd found me. Piper sighs. The front door is unlocked because I was about to head to the library, but I forgot my card and had to run back in to get it. You can't leave the front door unlocked anymore, Popper. Even for a minute. It's too dangerous. Belle, I really think you're overreacting to this. I'm sure that we will be fine here. Now I have to get to the library. The others are at work. Will you be fine here by yourself? Of course I will. I will lock the door. Plus, I hired that bodyguard and he'll be showing up soon. If something happens before then, I can call him. Glad to hear it, though I'm sure you won't need it. Better to be safe than sorry, right? Piper nods, calls out a goodbye, and I hear the lock click. But I check it just to be sure, before continuing to my room. Then, for good measure, in case someone slipped in when she wasn't watching, I check every room in the house before setting the bags on the bed in my room. I have a few minutes before I have to get ready, so I decide to jump online and see if there are any news stories about the murder. Detective Stanton said he would call me, but I don't really have faith that he will. My laptop takes only a minute to fire up. In my job, it's important to have fast technology. I don't have to edit all my videos because I've gotten pretty good at doing a perfect take the first time, but there are times when I need to add some zing to the videos. I pull up a search engine and type in the news station. There's nothing on Rudolph or the murder, but it makes me wonder if I can look up statistics on how many people are killed after witnessing a murder. I'm certainly not Piper, who would be better at this, but I can try. I stare at the blinking cursor for a second. How do I put this in? What do I search for? People killed after witnessing a murder is what I finally decide on, but the results that come up aren't exactly what I'm looking for. However, one of them does catch my eye. It's a story from years ago about a girl being murdered in Rudolph, Washington. Suddenly, the words of Mrs. Claus come back to me. Against my better judgment, I click the link and scan the story. Claire Higgins was leaving her shop for the day when she was attacked from behind by Jeffrey Mason. After knocking her unconscious, he dragged her to a deserted part of the downtown area where he allegedly stabbed her and left her for dead. Claire was found the next day and the police began searching for her killer. It was months later when someone came forward to the police and informed them that Jeffrey Mason had bragged about killing a girl. I scroll down, and my breath catches when I see the picture. It's old and grainy, but it looks very much like the spot where I saw the girl get killed. How is that possible? Is Jeffrey Mason still alive? Is he out of jail? Or maybe there's a copycat? I fall down the rabbit hole searching for any information on Jeffrey Mason. Or Claire Higgins, but I come up empty. Jeffrey is still in prison serving a life sentence. He had no family, and Claire's family is all dead. Of course, it could still be a copycat. But I'm not sure how they would even know about the murder. I've lived here most of my life, and I'd never heard of it before. But Mrs. Claus had. Who is Mrs. Claus? Maybe an old friend of Mason's? She seemed younger but maybe her makeup is a ruse to make her appear like a young woman trying to look older. I snap a picture of the screen with the initial story, making sure to get the URL in the picture, and then I send it to Jackson Powers. Maybe this will help him believe me. He may have agreed to protect me, but it was clear it was for the money and not because he believed I was in danger. I may not have the best street smarts, but I am good at reading people. 
Just as I hit send, a loud thud followed by a crash causes me to jump and nearly drop my phone. Once again, my heart thumps into overtime, though it didn't sound like the sound was in the apartment. I look around for something heavy to use as a weapon, settling on a rolling pin Hannah keeps in the kitchen for when she bakes, and then I slowly open the front door. There's no one on the landing, so I open the door a little wider and glance both directions before taking a step out. Hello? Is someone there? Belle? Is that you? The voice belongs to our downstairs neighbor, Mrs. Carmichael, an elderly woman who lives alone beneath us. She's the sweetest old lady and quiet as a mouse, generally. Of course, it might not be Mrs. Carmichael. It could be someone good at disguising their voice. That does happen, doesn't it? Mrs. Carmichael, are you okay? I fell and knocked over a shelf. I need some assistance. Can you come and help me? I never would have second-guessed helping her before, not only because the woman would never hurt a fly, but also because she rewards favors with the most delicious chocolate chip cookies. But suddenly, I can't help wondering if this is some ruse. Maybe the murderer has her captive and is forcing her to say these things to lure me down. I send a text message to Jackson, asking him to come now, and then step outside, pulling the front door shut and locking it behind me. A rolling pin isn't going to do much, but it's all I have at the moment. I'll be right there, Mrs. Carmichael. Please don't let this be a mistake, is the repeating thought in my head as I cautiously make my way down the stairs. Mrs. Carmichael's door is ajar when I reach it, and I move the rolling pin so that I'm holding it over my shoulder like a bat. Then I push the door open a little more. Mrs. Carmichael? Over here, Belle. I can't see her, but it sounds as if her voice is coming from behind her couch. So I cautiously make my way over to her. I'm still not totally convinced it's not the killer trying to lure me in. But as I round the couch, Mrs. Carmichael's form comes into view. Belle, what are you doing with that rolling pin? Realizing I'm still holding it like a weapon, I place it on the floor. Sorry, Mrs. Carmichael. I had to be sure it was you. Who else would it be? The elderly woman asks, a note of annoyance in her voice. I've lived here for ten years. I hold out my hand to help her up. I think someone is after me, so I'm just trying to be careful. Were you attacked? I glance around the room, but it doesn't look like someone attacked her. The only mess seems to be right around us. No, I fell trying to clean the knickknacks on the top shelf. Her gaze drops to the shards surrounding us. Now they're all broken. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Carmichael. Where's your broom and I'll help you clean up? She points to the kitchen, and after retrieving the broom and dustpan, I return and begin sweeping up the broken glass and ceramic. Don't you have someone who normally comes and cleans for you? Usually, but Misty was sick this week, so I figured I could do it myself. Now, what did you mean when you said that someone is after you? Oh, I don't want to burden you with the details. Not after all of this. You have enough on your plate without hearing about my crazy situation. Mrs. Carmichael shakes her head. Nonsense. I'll be a little sore, but otherwise I'm fine. Now I've baked some cookies. I'll put some tea on and then you can tell me all about your story. I could use a little adventure. Before I can say anything else, the woman totters off to the kitchen. I check the clock on my phone. I have a few minutes before Jackson should arrive, so I guess I'll be staying for tea and cookies. When the mess is completely cleaned up, Mrs. Carmichael points to a chair at the kitchen table and I sit. Now spill, she says. I tell her the whole story, and unlike my friends, or even Jackson, she simply nods. 
You know, I had a very similar experience once. You did? I blink at her, unable to picture Mrs. Carmichael going through a harrowing experience like mine. What happened? Well, I was staying at a cabin in the woods with my family one summer. I must have been about ten. Anyway, there were a few other cabins near us. Most were occupied by families like us, but one was just a man and a woman. One night, I saw the woman hauling something out of their cabin and toward the lake. I could have sworn it was a body. She dumped the bag in the lake and then came back. I watched the whole thing through my window and told my parents the next morning. They didn't believe me, but I knew she had dumped something in that lake. I am enthralled by her story and lean forward. How did it end? Well, I continued to watch that cabin while we were there. I never did see the man again, and my parents wouldn't call the police so I couldn't prove anything. The woman left the next day, and we finished out our stay. I forgot about the incident after we left. However, a few days later, a story aired on the news about that lake. Evidently, a bag of clothes was found floating in the lake, and it turned out the couple had gotten into a huge fight. She had thrown all his clothes into a bag and then dumped them in the lake, which is what I saw. So it turned out to be nothing. I should be relieved, but I'm kind of disappointed. I had hoped that perhaps I would finally have someone to share my experience with. But alas. Well, nothing more than an overactive imagination. I'm certainly glad my parents didn't get the police involved. Now I'm not saying that is what happened to you. But it is easy to build things up in our minds sometimes. And there it is. She thinks I'm making it all up too. Thank you, Mrs. Carmichael, for the story and the tea and cookies. I should probably get back to my place now, but let me know if you need anything else. I will, dear, and thank you. With a final nod, I head back to my apartment. But even though I know I locked the door... I'm suddenly convinced that someone has gotten in while I was down with Mrs. Carmichael, and they're just waiting for me to come in. I can't go in there now, not until I know it's safe. Pulling out my phone, I shoot another text to Jackson. Where are you? Chapter 12 Jackson She's texting me already. The woman barely left my office two hours ago, and she's already texting me. I have a bad feeling that taking this job is going to be more work than I even expected. With a sigh, I close my computer and grab my stuff. You heading out already, boss? Dave asks as I step out of my office. He checks his watch again, as if sure he's reading the time wrong. I am, but I'm not going home. I have to escort our newest client somewhere. Shopping, probably. I grumble as I shrug into my coat. Shopping is one of my least favorite things to do. In my book, it ranks right up there with root canals and watching paint dry. He flashes a sympathetic smile. Hey, at least it's a job. That is true, and maybe it will be enough to keep the doors open a little longer. I hate that I'm letting Dave down as well. If it were just me, it wouldn't be so bad. I'm sure I could find another job, and I know Dave can too, but I still feel responsible for him. Hey, we'll figure it out. You just keep our clients safe. I nod and exit the office, wishing I had Dave's optimism. The chill hits me before the first snowflake, and I sigh in agitation. I'm not a fan of the cold or the snow. We don't get enough of it for people to know how to drive in it, so it just tends to make the roads more dangerous. It will also probably delay my arrival, which won't go over well with Bell. Though I'm not worried about someone following me, I still scan the area as I walk to my car, as well as the mirrors as I drive to Belle's house. 
Old habits die hard, I guess. Nothing appears out of the ordinary on the journey, but I take a second to scout out her parking lot just in case. When I'm sure that no one is lying in wait to attack her, I park and open my door. But before I can even step out, my phone chirps again. Where are you? The message reads. I roll my eyes, not bothering to respond as I'm literally 10 feet from her door. I expect her to be waiting inside, maybe even locked in a closet or hiding in the shower. So I am floored when I see her outside the door shivering. What took you so long? She asks through chattering teeth. I came as soon as I got your message, and in case you hadn't noticed, it's snowing outside, and drivers around here don't do snow. Why aren't you inside where it's warm? She chews on her bottom lip. I left to help the neighbor. That's why I texted you. And I just had this feeling that it was a ruse, and someone got in the apartment while I was gone. I was hoping you could check it out first. If only she were kidding, but the fear in her eyes makes it evident that she is not. Did you lock the door when you left? She nods. I did, but what if they found another way in? It was weird timing. I mean, I found that story about the killer from years ago, and then suddenly Mrs. Carmichael falls and needs my help. She never falls. With a heavy sigh, I run a hand across my chin. Your neighbor needing help does not constitute an emergency bell. Well, I didn't know that. I heard her calling for me, but I wasn't sure if it was really her or the killer disguising his voice. Her logic, or lack thereof, is astounding. I close my eyes and take a deep breath. How would the killer if he found you here, know to imitate the voice of your downstairs neighbor. He could have gotten to her first, you know, like the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood. She says this as if it's the most natural thing in the world, and maybe to her it is. I definitely have my work cut out for me. Shall we go inside and look around then? Were you followed? She asks, glancing around me. No, I was not. Now can we go inside? It's freezing out here. She nods and hands me her keys. I check the knob first, but am unsurprised to find it still locked. Then I quickly unlock it and hand back the keys. Though I'm not expecting any trouble, my hand touches my concealed weapon just to remind myself it's there. Then I push open the door. The apartment is quiet inside, and there's no obvious sign that anyone has been there. I step further into the living room, and then Belle gasps. What is it? I ask, turning to her. He was here, in my apartment. How do you know that? My purse is gone. I always set it here on this table when I come in, so that I know where it is. Now it's gone. Okay, let's make sure it's really gone before we jump to conclusions. Is there any chance you put it somewhere else? Belle shakes her head. No, I always put it there. I wander a little further into the living room so I can see the kitchen as well. And as I do, something small and black on the couch grabs my attention. Is that your purse? I ask, pointing. As she steps to my side, I catch the scent of cherries and vanilla again. That is my purse, but I didn't put it there. You see, someone moved it. Why don't you check to see if anything is missing? The purse doesn't look bothered. It's not upside down with its contents spilled around or knocked on its side. It's just sitting there, like an ironic punctuation to Belle's insanity. Are you sure I should touch it? Won't that make it hard to run fingerprints? We aren't running fingerprints. That's out of my jurisdiction. And even if we were, your prints would already be all over it. She doesn't look convinced, but she opens the purse and pokes her finger around inside. Nothing is missing, but he probably took pictures of it. 
What would be the point of taking pictures of your purse? Not my purse, she says with an eye roll. My ID. Even though her logic makes absolutely no sense, I play along with her. Okay, what would be the point of taking a picture of your ID? If he was here, he already knows where you live. Do you think he would care about your birthday or your height? She throws her hands up in the air. I don't know. I don't think like a killer. Maybe he's playing a mental game to get in my head. Or maybe he just wants to mess with me before he kills me. That's not usually the way murderers work. At least not the one you described to me in this situation. He seemed more like a murderer of opportunity, not a lie-in-wait stalking his prey type. She jams her fists so hard on her hips that I'm afraid she'll leave indents and raises her eyebrows at me. You've known a lot of murderers, have you? More than you, I'd wager. Look, I wasn't a profiler, but I studied a lot of cases. A stalker type wouldn't have killed a woman in broad daylight because he'd be more likely to get caught. So it's highly unlikely he'd be stalking you. But let's just say he is, I continue, when Belle opens her mouth to interrupt me. When would this guy have had time to do this anyway? She lets out an exasperated sigh. I told you when I was downstairs helping Mrs. Carmichael. I texted you right before I went down there in case it was a trap. Oh my gosh, this woman. I refrain from performing a facepalm, though it takes great effort, as I can't believe she called me over here for that. And was it? No, she fell trying to clean some of her knickknacks on the top shelf, but he must have snuck in then. How would he have gotten in? The front door was still locked, and it's not like he could scale the wall to go in a window. I don't know. Maybe he has a key. Maybe the killer knew someone at the lodge, and that person stole my key while I was sleeping and made a copy. I shake my head at her. It's a good thing you're not a writer, because that plot isn't believable. I have no doubt that Belle is imagining all of this but I can also tell that she is not going to let it go until I can assure her it's safe. Would you like me to check the rest of the room so you can be assured no one is in here? Yes, but I don't know if that will be enough. I'm still not sleeping in your hallway. She rolls her eyes. No, I mean a hotel. I don't want to endanger my friends, so it might be time to consider staying somewhere else. I think you're jumping the gun just a bit. Let me check the place out and then you can monitor it for the next few days. I don't know if I have a few days. I press my lips together to keep from responding to her dramatics. If Belle ever needs a job, I'm pretty sure she could get hired as an actress. Still, it's my job to protect her, not judge her, though she is not making that part easy. I clear each of the rooms, taking note of the placement of items in each. Nothing leads me to believe that someone was in the apartment, but I keep that information to myself. Everything is clear, I tell Belle when I return to the living room. I think you're going to be okay. She scoffs. For now, maybe, but he will strike again. Did you read the story I sent you? That Jeffrey Mason guy could have a copycat. The picture looked like where I saw the crime Friday night. I have no idea what she's talking about because I ignored the story, but I can't tell her that. I skimmed it, but it's on my reading list for tonight. It better be, or else this is just going to keep happening. I promise I will read it tonight. Now, did we need to go somewhere? She looks at me for a second and then snaps her fingers. Oh, right. Yes, work. Work? You want me to watch you while you work? Of course. If the killer has found my social media pages, then he knows where I work. That's probably the most important place I need protection. The thought of sitting and watching her work all day sounds about as appealing as watching a documentary on bugs. But it is part of the job. Okay, so what does that entail? 
going around and filming a bunch of videos? Belle scoffs as she grabs her purse. Hardly. Being an influencer isn't my main job yet. I'm a cosmetologist. Right. Shopping sounded bad enough, but sitting around watching her do hair and makeup sounds even worse. What did I get myself into? Chapter 13. Jackson. It's after dark by the time I drop Belle off at her apartment, and my grumbling stomach reminds me that I haven't eaten. I shoot off a group text to Dave and Ethan, asking if they want to meet up for dinner. Ethan, I'd love to, man, but I have to finish editing this latest piece for the documentary showcase. You're still coming, right? Jackson, of course, wouldn't miss it for the world. Although I guess that depends on if Belle needs me that night or not. Dave, I can eat. I'm starving. Burgers okay? Jackson, you bet. We agree on stands because it has the best burgers in town, and I head that direction. Dave is waiting inside when I arrive. So how's the new client? Dave asks as I take a seat. Oh man, you'll never believe who it is. Remember that woman from the tree lighting ceremony? The influencer one who was being so pushy? Dave's eyebrows arch as he sets the menu down and leans forward. You mean the one you yelled at? The tourist you thought we'd never see again? I thought she was blonde. Okay, first, I didn't yell at her. I scoffed at her. There's a difference. But yeah, same one. And she was blonde. Is. She was wearing a disguise when she came into the office because she thinks she saw a murder that night in Rudolph. I haven't heard anything about a murder on the news. Dave picks up his cell phone, and I know he's scrolling through the news. That's because there was no murder. I don't know what she saw, but it wasn't a murder. I even checked with Stanton just to be sure, but he said there was nothing there. What's her name again? Belle Duval. Belle. He taps away on his phone. So how long is she going to want you to protect her? I shrug. Who knows? Until she forgets about it, I guess. At least she's got money, although I don't know if it will be enough to keep us going much longer. How was the office today? I ask, as I pick up my menu. He grimaces and glances up at me quickly before returning his attention to his phone. Are you sure you want to know? Probably not, but tell me anyway. Did we get any calls? Just that Bambi lady again, wondering when you're going to get back to her. Look, I know it's slow, but what if we did some advertising or something? He looks up from his phone, but his expression looks as if he's afraid I'm going to bite his head off at the suggestion. I don't know. I sigh and lean back in the booth. How do you advertise a protection agency? Maybe this was just never meant to be. Don't say that. I think we can make this work if we can get some exposure. What about Belle? She's an influencer, right? I chuckle as I think back over my day. Well, she says she is, but she still works another job. I had to sit and watch her do makeovers all day. To be fair, though, I had no idea what women have to go through. Okay, but makeup artist aside, maybe you could get her to talk about how great a job you're doing protecting her? Even if she isn't as big as she'd like to be yet, her online presence is pretty strong. He hands me his phone, and I find myself staring at Belle's Instagram page, with over a hundred thousand followers. I think it could help. I don't know. I sigh and hand the phone back. It feels kind of like begging for attention. I already got on her for doing that, so it would be pretty hypocritical of me to do the same thing. Yeah, well, maybe arguing with tourists wasn't the prudent thing to do. Dave says, fixing me with a pointed look. I hold my hands up in surrender. You're right, I've just been jaded ever since the mandate and Stacy. His face softens. I get it, 
the mandate rocked your world, and Stacy shouldn't have posted your story, but she was never right for you. I couldn't tell you that then because who was I to talk, especially with my marriage to Diane falling apart, but I never liked that girl. I chuckle again. I guess it's a good thing we didn't open a matchmaking agency then. No doubt. But seriously, maybe when the job is done, I can ask her to leave a good review or something. I really think Belle could help us out. The waitress appears at that moment, and her face brightens as she catches the last of Dave's words. Are you two talking about Belle Duvall? I love her. I follow her on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and Snapchat. She counts the platforms off on her fingers as she names them. Dave smiles at me. See, what did I tell you? The waitress leans in like she's about to share a secret. Did you guys know she witnessed a crime and now she's worried that someone might be after her? Actually, we did, Dave says, his chest puffing out. Jackson here is the guy she hired to protect her. The waitress's eyes go big, and her hand flies to her chest. Oh my gosh, so she really is in danger? Can you tell me why? No, I cannot. I'm afraid that would go against the contract I have with Miss Duval. I shoot Dave a look. He's walking on dangerous territory sharing this much information. The waitress's face falls. Oh, I guess that makes sense. Well, can I take your picture so I can post that I waited on the man protecting Belle Duvall? I don't think that would be appropriate either, I begin, but Dave cuts me off. Of course, Jackson would be happy to pose with you, as long as you post that Powers Protection Agency is the provider. He shoots me a look that says I better not disagree again. Oh, I'd be happy to. She pulls her phone from her pocket and hands it to Dave. Against my better judgment, I stand next to her and let Dave take the picture. Then he hands the phone back. This is so exciting. Let me just post this really quick. Her fingers fly across the phone. Evidently, she's an avid poster, too. Powers Protection Agency. There, all done. She puts the phone away and smiles at us. I'm Dana, by the way. Thanks for letting me do that. Now, what can I get you? We both order burgers with fries and drinks, and then Dana scurries away. Before you say anything, Dave begins, shaking his head at me. That was free advertising, my friend. It was a shameless plug. Well, shameless or not, maybe it will bring in some new customers. I hate that he's right and I hate even more that we're having to resort to this. What will you do if the agency does go under? It's not going to go under, Jax. Just humor me. It will be bad enough if I lose my income, but I won't be able to live with myself if I cost Dave his as well, and he has no backup plan. I've got my tech skills to fall back on. If we go under, and for the record, I don't believe that's going to happen— I'll find a job creating websites or writing code. I nod, satisfied at least that Dave has skills to fall back on. I, on the other hand, have no idea what I would do if the agency went under. Being a cop was all I'd wanted to do since I can remember. And when I got bounced out for not complying with a policy that I didn't agree with, I thought it was the end of the world. It was Stanton who recommended opening a bodyguard agency, and it seemed like a great idea until I realized the client pool wasn't very big in the small town of Cooperville. Now I've gone through almost all of my savings, and I'm quickly falling into the red with no clear way out. What about you, though? What will you do if... He doesn't even finish the words, as if uttering them will make them come true. I shake my head. I don't know. Until the policy changes, I can't go back to being a cop, and I'm not sure what other skills I have. Then we have to make sure that doesn't happen, and Belle might very well be the one to help. Our food arrives then, which keeps me from having to respond. 
but his words continue to rattle around in my brain. Could Belle really keep the agency afloat? And if so, can I ask her to do that? It's late in the evening by the time I get home and pull up the story Belle sent me. Though I still don't think she witnessed a murder, I peruse the story. I didn't see whatever Belle did, but the details do seem really similar. Is it possible the murderer just did a really good job cleaning up? Tomorrow, I'll give Stanton another call. It's doubtful he'll have anything new yet, but I want to make sure he knows about this case as well. Chapter 14. Bell. As I dress for work the next day, I shoot off a text to Jackson asking him to meet me at 9.30. Nothing happened yesterday, but I'm still not feeling confident that the threat is over. Plus, tonight after work, I have to do some shopping, and there's no way I'm doing that without protection. So how are things going with the bodyguard? Charlie asks as I enter the kitchen. I shrug. Fine, I guess. I mean, I'm still here. See, we told you there was nothing to worry about, Hannah says. Well, I won't go that far. It's been a quiet few days, but until I know the threat is over... I'm not relaxing completely. As if to punctuate my point, my cell phone rings. Fear squeezes my heart as I glance down and see the unknown caller flash at me. Give it to me, Charlie says, grabbing my phone from my hand. She taps the button and holds it to her ear. Hello? Who is this? Hello? After a few seconds, she ends the call and hands it back to me. Still think there's nothing to worry about? I ask Hannah as I shove the phone back in my pocket. I do. Do you think the detective you talked to in Rudolph can put a trace on your phone? I mean, it's probably telemarketers, like Charlie said, but maybe a trace would confirm. I shake my head. I don't know. I guess I can try. But I don't really have high hopes that he'll be able to do anything. You didn't see him, but he seemed a little lazy to me. Apathetic might be a better word, Charlie says. I didn't get lazy, but he certainly didn't seem in a hurry to do anything. Still worth a shot. Plus, doesn't your bodyguard have a connection with him? Maybe he can ask the detective and get a better response. Maybe. Speaking of which, he should be here in half an hour, so I better get breakfast. I try to push the worry from my mind as I make a waffle and grab some coffee, but it lingers at the back of my mind like a constant threat of impending rain. Where are Katie and Popper? I ask as I take my plate to the table. Katie had to work early, and I'm fairly certain Piper is still in her room slaving away on that paper, Hannah says with a roll of her eyes. I hope she finishes soon. Me too, but do you think it will really matter? Popper has always been a bit of a loner. I pour some syrup on my waffle and begin to cut it into bite-sized chunks. Charlie taps her fingers against her mug. Yeah, we should try to get her out more, but I'm not seeing her joining me at the gym. You're not seeing any of us join you at the gym, Hannah says with a laugh. But I agree we need to find a way to get Piper out among people other than us. Maybe after the new year it will get better, I say. But of course that depends on whether the murderer I saw is caught, because if not, I see a very homebound new year for me. I may have told Jackson money was no object, but I can't afford to pay him forever. We finish breakfast in silence, and the knock on the front door comes just as I finish washing my plate. I open the door, but step back when I realize Jackson is staring at something on our doorstep. It's a red rose, a single rose, that normally would be seen as sweet or romantic, but now I wonder if it's a sign. Is that from you? I ask, my voice shaking slightly. No, but it appears one of you has an admirer. 
Jackson says, lifting a piece of paper with just the tips of his fingers. There's a note. I'm afraid to ask, but I have to know. What does it say? Touching it as little as possible, he opens it and skims the words. Your beauty does not compare to this rose, but I hope it brightens your day. Merry Christmas. A rose? Why on earth would the killer send me a rose and a note like that? He looks up at me, his brow furrowed. How do you know the note is for you? Don't you have roommates? Beauty, a red rose, and my name is Belle? There's no doubt that this is for me. Didn't you see Beauty and the Beast? It's a good thing Jackson isn't a detective because his detecting skills are lacking. I think you might be assuming a little too much, but if it's okay with you, I'll take the note down to the police station and see if they can run fingerprints on it. You think they'll do it? Well, I can't guarantee anything, but I still have some friends in the department. I might be able to call in a few favors. Do you think you could ask them to trace my phone as well? I got another call this morning with no one on the other end. I can try. Do we have time to swing by there first on the way to your work? I check my watch. It will be cutting it close, but there should be time. Yeah, if we go right now. I need to put this in a bag first. Do you have one? Sure, come on in. I step back to let him enter. Hey, I recognize you. Charlie says as she sees Jackson. Aren't you the guy who was at the tree lighting? The one who yelled at Belle? Hannah asks. I didn't yell at her. Jackson's voice fades, and he shakes his head as if realizing this is not an argument he wants to get into. Yes, I'm that guy, and I should have been nicer. Jackson Powers. He holds out his hand, and Charlie and Hannah shake it, introducing themselves as they do. I grab the bag and hand it to him, watching as he gingerly puts the note and the rose inside. Then I motion him toward the door. Okay, let's go. There will probably be questions from Hannah and Charlie later, but I'll deal with them then. Let me do the talking, he says, when we pull into the parking lot of the police station. I nod, knowing that this is his area and not mine. But I don't miss the deep breath he takes before stepping out of the car. Why did he leave the force? Perhaps I'll need to ask that later. Powers, is that you? The man standing behind the desk asks as we enter. He's young probably in his early 20s, and he looks excited to see Jackson. Jackson, on the other hand, looks tense. His jaw tightens even as he offers a small smile. Hey, Richards, good to see you. Richards leans forward, glances around, and then lowers his voice. Does this mean you're coming back? We've sure missed you around here. No, not yet, at least. Is Granger in? Well, I hope it's soon. It stinks what they did. Yeah, he's in. Go on back. So many questions flit through my mind, but I keep them to myself as I follow Jackson down a hallway to a room filled with desks. He stops at one near the back. Hey, Granger, you got a minute? The man behind the desk looks up and breaks into a wide grin. Powers? What are you doing here? Cashing in a few favors, I hope. Jackson proceeds to tell my story, and then hands over the bag containing the rose and the note. I was hoping maybe you could run this and see if you get any prints. We don't know that it was meant for Belle, but if it was, knowing who sent it would sure help. Granger takes a deep breath and glances at me. I can't put a rush on it, especially with it being Christmas, but I'll see what I can do. What about the trace on my phone? Can you see who's been making the calls? He pulls out a piece of paper. Give me your number and I'll see what I can do. Thanks, Granger. We appreciate any help you can give us. Jackson extends a hand and Granger takes it, standing as he does. You're welcome. And Powers, I hope you'll be back soon. We'll see. 
I wait until we're back in the car before turning to Jackson. Okay, I have to know. Why did you leave the force? I thought it was some sort of injury or misconduct, but they sure didn't make it sound like that. Jackson starts the car, ignoring my question for the moment, but I can see the muscles in his jaw flexing, so I know he's thinking about it. It wasn't an injury or a misconduct claim. There was a policy put in place that I didn't agree with and refused to comply with. Unfortunately, the options were to submit to the policy or get fired. I chose to stand by my convictions. I'm so sorry to hear that. Do you think the policy will change? He shrugs. Maybe, but even if it does, I'm not sure I want to go back. If they'll push a policy like that once, there's a good chance they'll do it again. And I'm not sure I can work for an agency that does that. Anyway, this isn't about me. This is about protecting you, and I'm completely capable of doing that. So, another thrilling day of makeovers today? I chuckle at his sarcasm. Yes, for a few hours, and then we have a special errand to run. An errand? What kind of errand? Shopping, of course. Of course. He sighs and shakes his head. Why would I have expected anything less? I think about telling him what kind of shopping, but I resist and instead bite back a smile. Let him think we're going shopping for clothes. He'll be surprised when he finds out what we're really doing. Chapter 15. Bell. I feel a little more comfortable shopping with Jackson by my side, but only a little. Every eye that glances my direction still makes me jump. Try not to look so guilty, he whispers as he leans closer. People are going to think we're trying to steal stuff. Right, sorry. His feet slow as I turn to enter the toy store. Wait, we're shopping for toys? Yeah, every year, I take a percent of what I earned over the year, and I buy toys and give them to the hospitals, shelters, and foster centers. It's like a tithe, only with toys. He blinks at me. Wow, that's really cool, and not what I expected. I cock a hand on my hip and tilt my head at him, because I know exactly what he expected. I bet you expected that I would be shopping for new outfits or something, right? I mean, as an influencer, it must be all about me, right? I'm a little pleased to see a light red tint his face. I'm not completely self-absorbed. I do like clothes, and I shop for myself often, but at Christmas, it's less about me and more about others, which is another reason why I need protection. I couldn't just give this up. Jackson has the decency to look chagrined as he rubs a hand across his chin. You're right. I made a hasty generalization and I shouldn't have. So let's get some toys and spread some cheer. I smile and for the first time let my guard down a little. There is something about Jackson that makes me feel protected. Maybe it's just his presence. Maybe it's his muscular figure or finding out that he has strong convictions. Or maybe it's his no-nonsense approach. Whatever it is, he reminds me a little of Charlie, only better. I lead the way down the baby aisle first and scoop up some of the best toys for infants and toddlers. The hospital doesn't always give them out to needy families, but I know a lot of families end up spending time in the hospital and they will let me donate gifts to those who are there over the holidays. In the next aisle, I grab board games and card games, dolls and robots, and costumes. Some of these will go to the hospital for older kids, but most will go to the shelters or foster agencies. Unfortunately, even in our small town, we have foster kids with no home for Christmas. And no home means no presents, generally. It's not as much as I would like to do, but I'm also working with a sponsor who will help me get the word out about fostering. So I'm hoping in the new year to be able to do even more. Finally, we wander down the video game aisle. 
I never know what systems kids have, so I try to get items that have a system and a game together just in case. Are we going to be able to fit all of this in your car? Jackson asks as we head to the checkout stand. I think so, but if not, I can always have some delivered, I say as the woman starts tallying up the items. Looks like you found everything you need, she says with wide eyes. I think so. I smile and then begin sorting out the items we'll take to the hospital and the ones that will go to the shelters and foster center. When we're finished, the cart is overflowing with bags. Okay, it might be a bit of a tight squeeze, I say, as we make our way toward the exit. You won't mind holding a few on your lap, will you? Not at all, he says with a smile. I smile back at him, enjoying the moment. I haven't worried a bit while shopping. Maybe I figured the killer wouldn't go in a toy store. But as we walk the main part of the mall, I can feel my anxiety rising again. He could be here, anywhere. Any of these men passing us could be him. And then suddenly, I think I see him. Brown hair, a beard, a long dark coat, and he's coming directly toward us. Jackson doesn't seem to notice. He's still going on about how amazing it is that I can purchase all these items. So I do the only thing I can think of. I grab him and pull him in for a kiss. For a second, he freezes. Then he responds and pulls me close. So close I can feel his heart beating against my own. But then, as if realizing what he's doing, he pushes back from me. What are you doing? Thankfully, he doesn't sound mad, just confused. But before I answer, I glance around. The bearded man is looking at us, but not like he plans to kill me. No, he's looking at us in confusion, like he's trying to figure out why we're making a scene in a public space. So, not the guy, obviously. Whoops. Sorry, I saw that bearded guy walking toward us and I thought he was the killer. I panicked. The bearded man is walking away, but I keep my voice low. You panicked and thought kissing me was the best way to escape a killer? I shrug. Well, I thought if he didn't get a good look at me, then he would just pass us by. He certainly wouldn't get a good look at my face if it was obscured by yours. Jackson takes a deep breath and then blows it out. That makes no sense. Look, I know you saw the guy and I didn't, but next time, just point him out. I'll observe and do what's necessary if it comes to that. No kissing involved. Do you have an issue with kissing? It was just an innocent kiss. Not like I was trying to pin him against a wall or anything. Though I'm not sure I would mind if that happened. No, I don't have an issue with kissing. I just prefer to be the one initiating it with a woman I'm interested in. I shouldn't take offense to that. He's here because I'm paying him to protect me, not because he's interested. But it still stings a little. He's acting like kissing me was toxic or something. Fine, I won't do it again. I just didn't know what else to do. I'm not radioactive or anything, you know? What? He runs a hand through his hair in frustration, and it leaves a trail of hairs sticking up all over the place. I want to fix it, but I don't think he'd like that either. You're acting like I gave you some disease or something. I grab the cart and continue toward the exit, shivering as the cold hits and hating the involuntary motion because it makes me feel weak. No, I'm acting like someone trying to do his job. I don't kiss clients. Got it. I promise it will never happen again. I open the trunk of my car and begin shoving the bags in. I hate the feeling of rejection, even though I know that's not really the issue. It wasn't that big of a deal, I mutter under my breath, but that's not entirely true. I didn't have time to think about it when it was happening, 
but the memory of the brief kiss comes flooding back now, and I can't deny that I liked it, that feeling Jackson's lips respond to mine, even if only briefly, felt nice, that I wouldn't mind doing it again, often, and that is very, very bad, because to him, I'm just a client. Chapter 16. Jackson. I hear her mutter, it wasn't a big deal, but I don't say anything as I help her load the bags and then climb into the front seat. She's right that it wasn't a big deal. She freaked out, acted on instinct. A weird instinct, but instinct nonetheless. So why am I making such a big deal out of it? because my lips are still tingling, because for a moment I kissed her back and it felt good, because it reminded me of how long it's been since I kissed a woman and how nice it feels to kiss one, especially one that I find attractive. But I can't do that. I can't let the guard around my heart down again, and certainly not with her, not with a client no matter how beautiful she is. I glance over at her. Sitting in the passenger seat is hard for me. I like being in control. But she insisted since she knew where she was going today. And she is surprising me. When she said shopping, I had no idea she meant shopping for others. And she spent a small fortune. I don't know how wealthy Belle is, but I've known a few wealthy people and none of them were as giving as she is. She pulls into the hospital parking lot, parks, and takes a deep breath. You ready for this? I have no idea. What should I be ready for? She turns to look me in the eyes, and there is a profound sadness in her normal expression. Heartache. Come on. I follow her lead, grabbing bags from the trunk checking out the surroundings as I do. I'd feel better if I knew exactly what the danger I'm supposed to be protecting her from looked like, but since I don't, I'll keep my eyes peeled. What do you mean by heartache? I ask as we head toward the hospital door. She gives me a sad smile. You'll see. I've only been in a hospital once before, and that was in high school when my friend was in a car accident and broke her pelvis. She recovered fully, so I don't have the hospital dread that I know many people do, but there's a feeling emanating from Belle that is twisting my gut. Hey, Sally, Belle says to the woman at the counter. Can we go on up? She's on a first-name basis with the nurse? How often does she come here? Suddenly, all of my impressions of this woman are being bent and twisted. You bet. They'll be excited to see you. I'll let them know you're on your way up. Sally hands us visitor badges and then picks up the phone. Come on. Belle tugs on my arm as she leads me to an elevator. I follow, unsure exactly what I'm getting into. When we reach the fourth floor, the elevator opens and we step out. This floor must be the children's floor because there are murals on the walls, along with pictures of handprints and other things. A red-headed nurse with a pixie face hurries over to us. Hi, Belle. I'm so glad you're here. The kids will be excited to see you. Her eyes slide over to me, and the corners of her lips turn up in a coy smile. Who's your friend? He looks a little tall to be an elf. Belle chuckles. Well, that's a long story, Penny, but his name is Jackson, and today he's here to help. The nurse gives me another once-over and then winks at Belle. Whatever you say. Come on, the kids are all hanging out in the lounge. We follow Penny down the hall to a large room, decorated in red and green. There's a Christmas tree twinkling in one corner and rows of stockings hung on the wall but it's the children who grab my attention. They sit in various chairs and couches around the room, including a few in wheelchairs, 
but there is a feeling of sadness hanging in the air, at least until Belle speaks. Hey, guys, I ran into this jolly man outside, and he said to give you these. I guess he figured you could use some magic cheer. But it's not Christmas yet, one boy says, though his eyes are dancing as he stares at the bags. Well, I guess he figured you could use your cheer a little early. Besides, it's only a week until Christmas. Now, let's see what he gave me for you. She digs through the bags until she finds the perfect gift for him. Then she goes around the room doing the same for each and every kid there. When she's finished, the kids are not only smiling, but the whole room feels lighter and more carefree. Then she pulls out her phone and all my admiration of her disappears again. Of course she would have to make a video of this. Nothing altruistic from the influencer. Guys, you will never believe this, she begins. Santa came early and dropped off these amazing gifts for kids at my local hospital who are having to spend Christmas here instead of at home. She scans the room, but I notice she is careful to keep the camera low, so only the gifts are shown and not the kids. If something similar happens in your town, be sure to post the link to your video here. Maybe we can inspire secret Santas all over the country to make this time merry and bright for kids everywhere. She ends the video, hands the last few bags to Penny, waves to the kids, and then leads the way back to the elevator. When the doors close, I catch her sniff and surreptitiously wipe a tear from her eye. Okay, what was that about? You made a video, but you didn't make it about you. She looks up at me, her eyes sparkling with unshed tears. That's because it's not about me. It's about those kids in there. Those are the long haulers. Kids with cancers or serious diseases who will spend months in a hospital before they get to go home, if they're lucky. Bringing them toys won't make their stay any shorter, but my hope is that it will make it more enjoyable. That's a really nice thing you do. I hate to admit it, but Belle is turning out to be a lot more interesting than I initially thought. Unfortunately, interesting and beautiful make for a dangerous combination. It's one reason I like being an influencer. Not only does it give me money to help people, but it gives me the ability to share the concept of giving with more people. Last year, I had 50 people post videos of them doing the same thing in their town. This year, I'm hoping for over 100. So you do the videos just to inspire others to give? She nods. Exactly. Look, there are perks to being an influencer. Companies do send me free items, and I do make money off some of my videos. But the biggest perk is that I get to use my platform to encourage others to give. The elevator door opens and she steps out. Come on, we have one more stop here. She leads the way to the counter, and I quickly realize we're in the birth center. They won't let us be on the counter. Evidently, security here is tighter than the rest of the hospital. But they take the gifts and thank us. After a similar stop at the local shelter and the foster care headquarters, we head back to her apartment. I have an event to attend tomorrow at 6. Will you be able to meet me here at 5.30? You got it. Do you need me to come check the apartment again? She shakes her head. No, that's Charlie's car, so I know she's inside. I'll be fine. Why does the thought of not walking her to the door leave me feeling just a bit disappointed? Okay, then I'll see you tomorrow. Give me a call if you need anything before then. Thanks, I will. She waves and then hurries up her stairs. I wait until she enters her apartment before backing out of the spot. It's close to dinner time, so I shoot off a quick text to Dave and Ethan, asking if they want to meet for dinner. Dave. Only if I can bring food. You almost poisoned us the last time you cooked. Jackson. I did not. 
You just didn't like my version of blackened chicken. Ethan. Blackened chicken isn't supposed to be charred, man. I'm with Dave here. I'm down as long as he provides. I could take offense, but my friends are right. None of us are great cooks, but I seem to be the worst of the bunch. When we don't order out, I live off TV dinners, ramen, and sandwiches. It's pretty hard to mess those up. Jackson. Fine. I'm game for anything, but Chinese sounds good. Dave. Deal. See you in 30. As I wait for the guys, I decide to check in with Stanton to see if he got the story I sent him. Anything new to report? I ask when he answers the phone. Hey, I saw your story. I wasn't there, but I do agree that it looks like the same place. The crime scene didn't find any blood, but they did find something interesting. Oh yeah? What's that? I highly doubt they found anything that will help this case, but I try to keep an open mind. Corn syrup and chocolate sauce. What? So, instead of a crime scene, Bell witnessed... What? An ice cream social? Except, why do those two ingredients sound vaguely familiar? I don't know. It didn't make sense to me either, but that's what they said. I'm checking the nearby cameras to see if we can find anything, but it's looking like a dead end. Yeah, exactly as I thought. I don't know what Bell saw, but a murder is seeming less likely every day. Still, there's the phone calls and the rose today, so something is obviously going on. Okay, Stanton, thanks for looking into it. Let me know if you find anything else. Will do. I end the phone call just as I pull into my place. Corn syrup and chocolate sauce. What on earth could that mean? Shaking my head, I push the items from my mind and hurry into the apartment and tidy up a little. It's not that messy, and the guys won't care, but it gives me something to do. A few minutes later, a knock sounds on the door. It's Dave, with three bags of Chinese food in hand. Where's Ethan? He asks as he steps inside and looks around. I shrug. Late as usual. He's still working on his masterpiece. My use of air quotes around the word masterpiece makes him chuckle. Yeah, wonder what this one is about. Ethan has been into filming for as long as we've known him, and he has yet to make anything that has garnered the attention of producers. But he swears it's a work of love, so we keep supporting him. Who knows? Maybe crime? Ethan always likes to tackle controversial topics in his documentaries. He swears that the controversy at least gets people talking, but I wonder if that talking doesn't kill his opportunities, though. Some agencies don't like being at the center of controversies. I was watching Miss Influencer today, Dave asks me as he sets the bags down. Not as bad as yesterday, I guess. I grab plates and silverware and take them to the table. After work, she went shopping, but not for clothes. Evidently, she donates a portion of her influencer income to buy gifts for needy kids at Christmas. Really? Dave looks up in surprise as he pulls out the containers. That's cool. Yeah, and surprising. I guess there's a little more to her than I originally thought. So are you going to ask her about helping us with a review? I don't know. Yes, Belle isn't as vapid as I first thought, but it still feels like begging to me. The front door opens, and Ethan glides in, shutting it behind him. What did I miss? Not much. We were just talking about what to do when my business goes under. I pull out a chair and plop down. You're not really in danger of going under, are you? Ethan grabs a plate and opens one of the containers, releasing tiny wisps of steam into the air. Yeah, we are. I've got one client right now, and while she's paying well, that won't be enough to keep us going much longer. Well, maybe I'll hit it big at this film festival, and you can be full-time security for me. You going to tell us what this movie is about yet? Dave asks. 
Ethan shakes his head. Nope, but the festival is in two days, so you'll know then. You guys are coming, right? You know we wouldn't miss it. The conversation turns to other topics as we eat, but my thoughts tumble back to my conversation with Stanton. Corn syrup and chocolate syrup? What on earth did Belle see? Chapter 17 Belle I hold up the second dress, sigh, and then toss it on the bed beside the first one. What's the matter with you? You never have a hard time picking an outfit, Katie says as she leans against my bed frame. You literally style everyone you meet, even if they don't ask you to. I know, but this one is different. I want to look nice but not draw attention to myself. There is still a killer out there looking for me. Okay, but won't you have your hot bodyguard with you? Her voice takes on a suggestive tone as she emphasizes the word hot. I turn to face her. I guess Charlie and Hannah have been talking. She shrugs. A little, but I remember the guy from the tree lighting too. He was gorgeous. And moody. The other day, I thought someone was heading toward us at the mall. I didn't know what to do, so I kissed him and he freaked out. Her head drops forward and she picks up a pillow, clutching it to her chest. Wait, you kissed him? What was that like? My face heats up as I remember the kiss. It was nice for a minute, and then he pulled away and acted like I had cooties. Katie giggles. I don't think anyone uses the word cooties anymore, Belle. But can you really blame him? Most people don't really like to be surprised with a kiss, especially when they aren't dating the person. Would you be cool if some strange guy came up and laid one on you? No, but I'm not a stranger. He's protecting me, for goodness sake. We literally spend half the day together. Besides, it was the only thing I could think of. This whole evading a killer is new to me. Still, you can't take his reaction personally. You probably just surprised him. I'm sure he would still do anything to protect you. Yeah, but this is the first time I'll be attending something planned. I've been talking about this party on my social media all month long. So if the killer is watching my media page, he'll know where to find me tonight. You can't think about that, Katie says, shaking her head. Did you hear anything about the phone calls yet? No, but it's only been a few days. I hold up a third dress and look at myself in the mirror. I like that one, and I think you can relax a little bit. Maybe. I decide to go with the third dress because nothing else is jumping out at me, and I know this one looks good on. Okay, I guess I'm ready. Try to have fun. You earned this. If only it was that easy. But I don't have time to think much more about it because the doorbell is ringing. I grab a bag and open the door to see Jackson, looking very handsome in a suit and tie on the other side. Oh, you dressed up. I don't know why I wasn't expecting him to look nice. I did tell him it was a dressy event but I certainly didn't expect the handsome man in front of me, nor did I expect the clammy feeling breaking out on my palms. I can't remember the last time a man made me nervous enough that my hands felt clammy. He gives me a crooked grin, and my heart beats a little faster in my chest. He was movie star hot before with a scowl, but he is even better looking with a smile. I can class it up on occasion. You look lovely as well. Shall we go? Is it my imagination or is he looking at me a little differently? I can't seem to find my voice, so I merely nod and wave to the girls sitting in the living room, who are watching us like we're the latest Bachelor episode. There will definitely be questions tonight. Jackson leads the way to his car 
and though I normally drive, he refuses to let me tonight. I've let you drive the last few days, he says when I protest, but this is not just work or shopping. This is a big event that you've been talking about on your page. I'm driving. Normally, I would find his authority off-putting, but I find I don't mind much as he opens the passenger door for me and helps me in. He's right that this event is more dangerous, and at least if someone follows us, he should be able to lose them. So are you getting some kind of award tonight? He asks as he heads toward the event center. I don't know. They never tell us ahead of time. It's actually only my second year being invited, And last year, I was so enthralled by everything that I didn't really pay much attention to the process. Just remember that I'll keep an eye out for anyone looking suspicious. If you see someone you think matches the guy, then just let me know. Right. No kissing. Don't worry. I got it. I wouldn't kiss him again even if I was put in the same situation and not because I didn't enjoy it. I did, but I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. Between worrying about the killer and thinking about the kiss, my thoughts have been consumed and my videos have been nearly non-existent. If I don't start posting again soon, I'll lose a lot of my followers. People think being an influencer is easy, but there's a lot of work to it. I have to keep my content consistent and consistently good. So, how long have you been a bodyguard? I ask, hoping to shift the conversation and the memory of the kiss from my mind. He exhales a sigh that seems to carry the weight of the world. Not long, only six months or so. And are you enjoying it? That is hard to say. Come on, it can't be that hard. Besides, we have a few minutes before we get to the event, and even though we've been spending all this time together, I feel like I barely know you. The muscles of his jaw tense, and I can see the veins pop. This must be a story he doesn't like sharing. Being a bodyguard was never my dream, but when I was forced out of the force, I had to do something. This seemed close. So you don't like being a bodyguard? It's not a matter of liking or not liking it. It pays the bills, for now. There's a finality in his words that tells me the conversation is over, but it doesn't keep me from wondering about him. What does he mean for now? Is his business in trouble? We spend the rest of the drive in silence, but it's not an entirely uncomfortable silence and a few minutes later he pulls into a parking space at the event center. Let me check the area first, and then I'll open your door, he says as he turns off the engine. I nod and watch him as he steps out of the car, scouts the area, and then finally opens the door for me. He takes my elbow, keeping his other hand near his side, as he leads the way to the front door. A doorman greets us, but I'm surprised there isn't security supplied by the event to check people as they enter. Maybe they're inside and dressed inconspicuously, though. Wait, I need to film this, I say, as we approach the big doors to the inner area. Jackson sighs. Are you sure that's what you should be doing right now? I've already been posting about this event all month, So if someone's watching my media, he's already seen it. Plus, it would be weird for me not to, but I promise I'll keep it short. He shakes his head and rolls his eyes, but agrees. I pull my phone out of my bag and load my social page. Hey guys, tonight is the night. I'm here at the Influencer Award Dinner. It's my second year, but last year I was so excited that I forgot to film it and I forgot to relax and enjoy it. So tonight, I'm going to try to do a little of both. I notice that Jackson is standing just out of the camera range, but that's fine with me. I don't want to have to explain who he is. So I'm going to open these doors, and you guys will get to see the room with me for the first time. 
I push open the door and tap the camera so it's no longer focused on me, but the room ahead of me. And boy, is it gorgeous. There are four giant Christmas trees in the room, one in each corner, and they're adorned with different ornaments. White twinkle lights hang from the ceiling along with red and green tulle. The tables are covered in red, white, and green tablecloths, and the china on each table is rimmed in gold. Wow, are you guys seeing this? I think they made it even more spectacular than last year. I'm going to go find my seat, but I'll be sure and post another video soon. Tell me what your favorite part of the room is, and if it matches mine, I'll be sure to give you a special shout out this evening. See you soon! I wave and then end the video, loading it to my media page before sliding the phone back into my purse. They pay you for that? Jackson asks, stepping close to my side again. No, they pay me to endorse items, but videos like these are what keep my fans happy and coming back for more, which is just as important. I'll never understand this world he says with a shake of his head. Jackson, is that you? Jackson's head whips up at the sound of his name being called, and he goes into protector mode, shoving me behind him. The tension radiating off of him is intense, but suddenly he relaxes. Ethan, what are you doing here? I got invited for the documentary I did earlier in the year on the homeless. What are you doing here? This isn't normally your jam at all. I'm here with Belle. She's a local influencer. He steps aside to allow me to be seen, and my eyes widen when I recognize the guy in front of me. Hey, aren't you the one from the hotel? We say at the same time. Wait, you've met? Jackson looks between Ethan and me, clearly confused. Sort of. My team was renting a room to work on the new documentary, and Belle and her friend were renting a room on the same floor. We rode the elevator together, but she was pretty quiet. In fact, didn't your friend say you were shy? Shy. Jackson's eyebrows lift nearly to his hairline. That's certainly not the word I would use. Well, her friend, what was her name? He turns his attention to me. Charlie, I supply. He snaps his fingers. Yes, Charlie, that's right. Anyways, she was the talker. Hey, you should bring her to my documentary premiere tomorrow night. Part of it takes place in Rudolph. Oh, I don't know if she'd be into that, Jackson begins. Sure I would. I love movies, and I'd love to see what your friend has put together. I know it's a little self-serving of me, but I'm also thinking that if his friend makes movies, then he might know people in the industry. I haven't acted much since high school, but I always enjoyed it. Perfect. Well, I'll give the tickets to Jackson. It was nice to see you again, Belle. He extends a hand and I shake it. Then Ethan saunters off to find his seat. Small world, huh? I say. Sure is. Come on, let's find your seat. I want to check out the escape route from the table, just in case. My table is near the front of the room, and Jackson sits us so that our backs are more to the stage than the rest of the room. These are the worst seats at the table. I'll be craning my neck all night to see the stage. He folds his arms across his chest and fixes me with a pointed stare. Better than not being able to see someone sneak up behind you. Fine, I say, and plop down into the seat he's picked for me. If I angle my chair a little bit, the view isn't too bad, but I sure hope they find the murderer soon so my life can go back to normal. Chapter 18 Jackson My eyes are supposed to be watching everything, but they keep straying back to Belle. She is stunning tonight with a long, dark green dress that brings out the color of her eyes. And even though I shouldn't be thinking about it, my mind keeps drifting back to the kiss. 
Although, if I'm honest, that kiss hasn't been far from my mind for long. I glance over at Belle, who still has her arms crossed. Okay, she wasn't too happy that I made her sit with her back somewhat to the stage. I can't really be angry at her. It would be more fun to be able to see the stage clearly. But then it would make my job that much harder. Besides, she's cute when she pouts. A man takes the stage and taps the mic a few times. The conversation in the room dies down. Thank you all for coming to our annual Influencer Award Dinner. Not only do we have a great meal planned for you, but we will be honoring some amazing people tonight. Starting with the lady who planned this event, Beverly Dirkwood. Let's give her a hand. Applause fills the room as a stunning brunette in a red slinky dress takes the stage. As she begins speaking, movement catches my eye, and I tense, my hand finding my concealed weapon, until I realize it's just the waiters bringing out the first course of food. Food? I hadn't even considered that food would be served, and that I would have no way to check her food first. Conflict erupts in my mind. If there's even a chance her food has been tampered with, then I shouldn't let her eat it. But there was no evidence of a murder scene, which means that the likelihood someone is after Belle is pretty small, and trying to poison her meal would be challenging. It would be nearly impossible to know which meal was going to Belle, so tampering with it in the kitchen would be unlikely. It would be a lot easier to tamper with the food at the table, so I monitor our waiter closely. Our waiter, a young man who doesn't look old enough to drink, fills the water glasses at the table, but he uses the same pitcher and puts nothing in Belle's drink. Is there something you need, sir? He asks when he catches me staring. No, thank you. The food comes then, salads followed by steak and potatoes, and finally an individual brownie topped with ice cream for dessert. With every plate, I watch the waiter, but he appears clean. I'm just about to relax a little when Belle grabs my arm. Oh my gosh, this is the category I'm nominated for. I should be focused on the stage, the announcer, the exits, something. But all I can seem to focus on is Belle's hand on my arm and the heat radiating through the fabric of my sleeve and traveling up my arm. What is wrong with me? I should not be affected by her touch or any woman's touch, for that matter. The winner is Belle Duval. Belle's mouth falls open and she squeezes my arm. That's me. I won, Jackson, I won. Come on. And then she takes my hand and pulls me toward the stage. I glance down at our hands and then force myself to pay attention to the crowd. If anything was going to happen to Belle, this would be the moment, and I have to be ready. Thankfully, Belle releases my hand as she takes the award, and my senses return to their duty. My eyes scan the crowd, watching for any hostile movement, but nothing happens. Belle gives her speech, and then we're returning to the table. I can't believe I won, she says as we take our seats again. I'm so glad you were here with me to share this moment. Then, as if realizing what she said, she pauses. I mean, I'm glad I didn't have to celebrate alone. Me too. But I have no idea if I'm responding to her first statement or her last. And I realize that I need to tell her what Detective Stanton found. It might not make a difference to her, or she might decide she no longer needs protection. But I can't not tell her. However, I can wait until we're alone. The drive home will be the perfect time. As soon as we're buckled in the car, I turn to her. Belle, I spoke with Detective Stanton yesterday. Yeah? Did he find the killer yet? No, but he did find something interesting. There was no victim when he went to the scene, so he sent the crime lab in just in case the killer had moved the woman. Belle nods. Smart. I'm sure he did after I saw him. I start the car and head back toward her apartment. 
But that's the thing. They didn't find any blood, not even remnants of blood. All they found was traces of corn syrup and chocolate sauce. Belle's forehead wrinkles in confusion. I don't understand. Corn syrup and chocolate sauce? What does that mean? I saw the woman bleed, so did the killer clean the scene with sugary toppings? I've never heard of such a thing. Belle's lack of knowledge, which infuriated me only days ago, now seems endearing. Look, Granger is still looking into the note and the phone calls, but I wanted to let you know what Stanton found, in case you decided you didn't need my services anymore. Are you kidding? If the killer cleaned the scene so thoroughly that no traces of blood remain, then he's even more dangerous and cunning than I thought. There's no way I'm ending protection until I know for sure he's in jail. I don't know how to explain to her that there may never be anyone in jail, because the killer she thought she saw doesn't exist. What if what you saw wasn't a murder, but something else? As much as I need the money, I won't feel right taking it from you if I'm not really protecting you from anything. What else could I have seen, Jackson? He had a knife. He stabbed her. She screamed and bled. That seems like a pretty clear murder to me. I shake my head, at a loss because I have no explanation for what she saw. Look, we have your friend's premiere tomorrow night, but I'll have to work first. Can you meet me here at noon? Of course. I pull into a spot at her apartment and turn off the car. Wait here. I get out first to check the area, even though I'm no longer sure exactly what I'm looking for. Then I open Belle's door and follow her to her apartment. Before she reaches the door, though, she gasps and freezes in place, causing me to bump into the back of her, pitching her forward. Instinctively, my arms wrap around her to keep from falling. Belle, what the... I don't finish the question because a current jolts through me, a current I am not supposed to feel with Belle, with a client, with any woman. Look! Her voice trembles as she points at her doorstep. A small wrapped package about the size of a thick book lays there, with another note attached. What does it say? I drop my arms from around her and pick up the note from the package. Just a little gift so you can see the same beauty that I do. What does that mean? Belle asks. I don't know. I guess we'd have to unwrap it to find out. Should we? Or should we take it to your friend at the police station? Let's take it inside and unwrap it carefully. If there are prints, they will most likely be on the tape holding it together. Belle nods and unlocks the door. I pull out my gloves and use them to pick up the package and carry it inside. Hey, Belle, how was the ceremony? Her roommates are all sitting on the couch watching TV, but I have no idea which one spoke. It was good. I won. Belle holds up her award, but her voice is still constricted with fear. Hannah sees me then, and the package in my hands and stands. Another gift? It would seem so. The girls all gather around as I place the package on the table and then undo the wrapping paper, keeping the paper as intact as possible. When it's peeled back, I open the lid of the box, but I am not prepared for what stares back at me. Is that a mirror? Belle asks, leaning over my shoulder to see inside the box. I use the gloves to lift the item out and examine it. It appears to be, and maybe an antique one at that. It looks just like the one the beast used in the movie. Her lips press together, and fear dances in her eyes. What does it mean? Why is he sending me a mirror? I shake my head. Though the gifts are odd, and perhaps a little creepy, they aren't really dangerous. So if he's trying to threaten her, he's failing miserably. Maybe it's not from the killer, but from some admirer who wants to tell you how beautiful you are. Charlie scoffs and shakes her head. But Belle already knows she's beautiful. Why on earth would she need a stranger to tell her that? 
I'm beginning to have my doubts that these gifts are for Belle, but I keep those thoughts to myself. Any objections if I take this to Granger? The girls all shake their heads. And after getting a bag from Belle, I gather up the items, being careful not to touch them, and place them inside. Okay, then I'll see you tomorrow at noon, Belle. I squeeze her arm and hold her gaze for just a minute. Probably a little longer than I should, but somehow this woman is affecting me. As I walk back to my car, I can't help but ponder this case. I'm not a detective, but none of this is making any sense. Chapter 19 Bell. What was that about? Hannah asks when Jackson is gone. What do you mean? You saw the mirror the same as I did. I don't know why, but it seems like the killer is intent on mentally torturing me before he kills me. She folds her arms across her chest and shakes her head. That is not what I mean. I mean, what was that look between the two of you? And his hand on your arm at the end? Well, they did kiss. Maybe he's developing feelings for her, Katie says. Wait, what? Charlie narrows her eyes at me. Why are we just hearing about this now? Because it wasn't a real kiss. I shoot a glare at Katie, who simply presses her lips together and shrugs. What do you mean it wasn't a real kiss? Piper asks, confused. Did your lips touch? Yes, but it wasn't planned. I thought the killer was approaching us, so I just grabbed Jackson and kissed him. Because you thought the killer wouldn't kill you if you were kissing someone? Charlie asks. Because I thought he wouldn't be able to see my face if it was hidden behind Jackson's. Anyway, Jackson freaked out and told me not to kiss him again. So I don't think there's anything behind the look you think you saw tonight. He's just doing his job. Yeah, I have employees who do their job every day, and they never look at me like that, Charlie says, shaking her head. That's because you're terrifying, Hannah says. Charlie shrugs, but doesn't disagree. It's not like that. Though, even as I say the words, I remember the look he gave me when he first picked me up, and the way my body tingled when I held his hand and how excited I was that he was there to see my moment. At least, I don't think it is for him. I sink down into a chair and drop my head in my hands. What am I doing? I'm not supposed to fall for the guy protecting me. Piper pushes her glasses up and consults her phone. Actually, the bodyguard trope is popular in romance circles. So if your life were a romance book, that would be the predictable outcome. But my life is not a romance book, I say, throwing my hands in the air. In fact, right now, it's more like a horror film. I have some unknown person out to kill me, leaving me creepy gifts and making phantom phone calls. You haven't had a phantom phone call in a few days, Katie says. But as if to prove her wrong, my phone starts ringing. I pull it from my purse and stare at the unknown caller ID. You were saying? I take a deep breath and tap the button, hoping I'll be able to hear something. Anything. Hello? Bell? Oh, thank goodness it's working. The sound of my sister's voice coming through the phone causes my mouth to fall open. Cecily? Why are you calling me from an unknown number? You will never believe this. I dropped my phone off the ferry last week and had to get a new one, but it's been having problems. It's not showing my phone number to people, and the last few times I tried to call you, I could barely hear you. But even though I was screaming, you couldn't hear me. Those calls were you? This should make me feel better. If I'm not getting phantom phone calls, then maybe no one is after me but that doesn't explain the gifts. Cecily laughs in my ear. Of course they were me. Who did you think they were? I explain to her what's been happening the last few days while my roommates stare at me, curious as to what is going on. Oh dear, I'm so sorry to have scared you. 
I guess I should reach out through your social media next time. It's just been so hectic. Anyway, I wanted to see if I could come see you for New Year's. I know Christmas is a little too close and I can't get away, but I'm trying to shoot for a few days off next week. Sure, that would be great, and I'd love to see you. Hey, before you go, what is your new number? She rattles it off, and I write it down before ending the call. I guess the phantom calls were my sister having issues with her new phone, I say. That's good news, right? Katie asks. That means the killer doesn't have your phone number. Or there is no killer, Charlie says. But what about the gifts? Hannah asks. Those are coming from someone. Yeah, but they might not even be for Belle, Charlie says, getting up from the table and moving back into the living room. She just assumed they were because she thinks someone is after her. Maybe the gifts are for one of us. There hasn't been a name on any of them. Could they be right? Could this all be in my head? No, I know what I saw. But how does that explain no crime scene? Or the traces of corn syrup and chocolate sauce at the spot? Am I paying Jackson to protect me from nothing? And if I am, do I tell him? What if he never wants to see me again? And why does that thought scare me more than a killer after me? Belle, you okay? Katie asks, picking up on my silence. Yeah, I'm fine. But... Am I? Chapter 20 Jackson Are you sure I'm dressed appropriately? Belle asks as I open her car door in the parking lot of the theater. Even though I thought she was dressed fine from her job, she insisted on changing into a cute pink skirt with leggings beneath and a sweater that looks like a puffy white cloud on top. I have to admit, the femininity of her outfit is even more appealing than the jeans and sweaters she wore to work. You look fine. This isn't the Oscars or anything. It's a bunch of indie filmmakers showing off the documentaries they've been working on for the last few months. Okay, if you're positive. I take her hand and help her stand. Believe me, you look beautiful. A buzzing sensation fills my ears as the warmth from her hand crawls up my arm. I should let go, step back, but I can't. There is something about Belle that is melting the ice that's been around my heart since Stacy blasted me on social media for standing for my convictions. She smiles at me and moves her hand to take my arm as we head into the theater. The seating is already mostly full, but Dave waves us over. I let him leave work early if he promised to save us seats. It's a good thing you're here, he says as we sit down. I don't think the jackets were going to cut it much longer. These people were getting vicious. Hey, Belle, good to see you again. Hey, Dave, you too. So do you guys know what Ethan's film is about? I shake my head. No, he always surprises us. Says it builds the suspense that way. I lean a little closer to her. If only he knew we weren't sitting on pins and needles wondering what it was. She giggles and slaps my arm. Well, I think it's nice that you guys support him. Sometimes I wish my friends were more supportive. What do you mean? They seem supportive of you. Of me, yes, but not my role as an influencer. Charlie won't even let me help her create an online presence, although I know I could get her more clients for her personal training. Katie and Hannah say they don't have time, and Popper, well, Popper is Popper. She uses her phone to look up information, and that's about it. I think about my own experience and the vile comments I got for standing up for what I believed in. Maybe they just didn't have a great experience with social media in the past. Keep showing them the good you do, and I bet they'll come around. The lights dim then, and a hush falls over the crowd. A mechanical whirr fills the air as the projector comes to life, and a man's face fills the screen. Thank you all for coming. We are so excited to showcase the hard work of these filmmakers for our third annual winter showcase. 
They've worked tirelessly over the last few months, and I think you will be excited to see their final presentations. Some will make you laugh, some will make you cry, some may have you checking behind you with every step. But all of them were made with heart, so sit back and enjoy. The scene switches to the first presentation. It's a documentary about adoption and how long couples wait who want a baby since there aren't enough babies in the system. It's a tearjerker, and though I don't shed a tear, I can hear the sniffles of people around me. The next film is not a documentary, but a short film about a man who wants to fly and tries several attempts before he settles down with a woman who likes to dress like a bird. I don't know if the filmmaker was going for a comedy, but I find myself chuckling through the movie. Then I see Ethan's name flash on the screen. His movie is much darker than I expected, starting with a splash of blood across the screen and the words, Serial Killers Among Us. Then a woman fills the screen. It's raining, and she's walking to her car alone. Suddenly, someone grabs her from behind, plunges a knife into her side multiple times, and then walks away, leaving the woman to fall to the pavement in a pool of blood. Gasps fill the room, and beside me I feel Bell stiffen. Then her hand is on my arm, and her fingers are digging in like claws. I look over to see her eyes wide and her skin as white as her sweater. Jackson, he filmed the murder. Her voice is barely a whisper as she stares at the screen. As I look back to the screen, I see a man leaning over a woman on the ground. I didn't see the spot that Bell did, but the area certainly looks like Rudolph. The man stabs the woman and she screams. Then blood begins to pool around her. But not blood, because this scene is faked, acted out for Ethan's movie. And then it hits me. Corn syrup and chocolate sauce. Ethan used to talk about what an odd combination it was to make fake blood, but the two together, along with some red food dye, created the perfect, sticky consistency of blood. Belle didn't see a murder. She saw Ethan's scene recreating a murder. I don't understand, she whispers beside me. Is Ethan the killer? Why would he show this? Isn't he afraid of getting caught? I shake my head, wondering how I'm going to explain this to Belle. Ethan's movie ends with him talking about Jeffrey Mason and his killing spree several years back. There are three other films after Ethan's, but I can't pay attention to any of them. And then the lights in the theater come up. Clapping ensues around us, but Belle is having none of it. She grabs my hand and pulls me out to a corner of the lobby, away from people. Aren't you going to do something? She asks, glancing around. Call Detective Stanton or your friend Granger, somebody? I place my hands on her arms. Belle, Ethan didn't kill anyone. Those were actors in the film. They were recreating Jeffrey Mason's murders. She shakes her head. No. Movies are filmed in studios with lots of lights and a director yelling cut every few minutes. There are trailers and food trucks. There was nothing like that in Rudolph. It's because this is a documentary, I say, as gently as I can. Ethan doesn't have a lot of money, so he usually films by himself or uses a drone. They rely on natural lighting because they don't have access to studios. Look, This explains why Stanton didn't find evidence of a crime scene. Corn syrup and chocolate sauce are used to make fake blood. But what about the guy who ran after me? Her words are slow and halting. She is clearly trying to make it make sense in her head. That was probably one of his guys. And my guess is he was either coming after you to yell at you for messing up their shot, or to have you sign a waiver that you wouldn't say anything. Like I said... Ethan likes to keep his movies secret until they debut. She blinks at me for a moment, and it's almost like I can see the gears turning in her head. So, I didn't witness a murder? I shake my head, but I'm sure it looked very convincing. I mean, you saw the film. He made it look real. So, no one is after me. 
She doesn't say it, but I can feel it coming. If no one is after her, she doesn't need me anymore. Well, this doesn't explain the phone calls or the gifts, but I think you can relax about a killer coming after you. The phone calls were my sister, she says softly. What? She nods and explains how her sister's new phone had been acting up. Well, that's good, I guess, right? I'm glad that she's safe, but I have this horrible feeling that this will be the end of us spending time together. And the thought tears at my insides. Although that doesn't explain the gifts, does it? No, but I think I'd like to go home now. I feel like a fool. Well, no. Knowing how hard Ethan works on his movies, I can totally understand why you thought it was real. I've been running from every brown-haired man. I hid under a table, Jackson. I pushed a man in a chocolate fountain. I kissed you. I don't know anything about the other things, she said, but I'm not letting her feel guilty for kissing me. I'm not sure I minded as much as I said I did. I move one hand to brush her cheek, but she shakes it away. You're just saying that to make me feel better. It was dumb. I'm dumb, and I'd like to go home now. I'll take you home, but you're not dumb, Belle. You're one of the nicest people I know. I want to argue more with her, to convince her that I don't find her dumb, but she's built a wall, and I know she won't listen to anything I have to say right now. She stays a good foot away from me as we walk back to my car, and the ride back to her apartment is completely silent. Before I can turn the car off to walk her to her door, she shakes her head. There's no need to escort me now. No one is after me. Regardless, I'll feel better knowing you've gotten inside safely. She shrugs but doesn't protest as I follow her to the door. Then she steps inside, flashes a small wave, and closes the door. I know I'll see her again. I'll have to, in order to get the final payment. But I have no doubt that whatever was building between us is now gone. Chapter 21 Belle The tears trickle down my cheeks as soon as the door closes behind me. I can't believe how stupid I was. Katie sees me first and rushes to my side. Belle, what's wrong? Was it Jackson? Do I need to give him a few words? Charlie asks, punching her right fist in her left hand. I shake my head. It's not him. He's fine, but it was all fake. What are you talking about? Katie says, leading me to the couch. The murder. It was a movie. A movie? How is that possible? Hannah asks. Wouldn't you have seen Cruz? Wouldn't there have been something in the papers about it? If it was a movie, we probably wouldn't have been able to even get into Rudolph. It would have been closed. I shake my head. It was a small documentary. I glance up at Charlie. You remember that guy, Ethan, we met on our way to the police station? Yeah, a little, I guess. Well, he's a friend of Jackson's and also a small filmmaker. Evidently, he was doing a documentary on Jeffrey Mason, and so he recreated the scene where he killed Claire Higgins. Who? Katie asks, looking around at the others. What are you talking about? I realized then that I never told them about Mrs. Claus telling me about the real murder or about looking it up. I only sent the story to Jackson, so I spill it all now. I don't think you should be so hard on yourself. Katie squeezes my shoulder. It sounds like it was a set of strange coincidences that could have fooled many. You guys weren't fooled. I look at each one of them and watch as their eyes drop or shift to the side. You all humored me because I'm Belle, but none of you really believed I was in danger. Okay, maybe we did think you were overreacting, but there's still the matter of the gifts. Hannah looks to the other girls, as if hoping they'll agree with her. We don't know who they're from. Actually, we do. Piper says quietly, 
and we all look at her. I was at the library this afternoon, and my research partner Ian gave me a gift. I opened it to find this inside. She holds up her arm to display a charm bracelet complete with a mirror, a rose, a sealed note, a heart, a tiny gift, and a mistletoe. He told me he left the other gifts anonymously, but wanted to tell me how he felt before Christmas. Wait, so is Ian why you've been spending so much time at the library? Hannah asks. A soft pink blooms across Piper's cheeks, and she drops her gaze. I have been working on my paper too, but I do enjoy spending time with him. I drop my head into my hands. Now even my stalker's not real. How do you guys put up with me? I'm so ridiculous. You are not ridiculous, Charlie says. You might be a little ditzy at times, but that's one of the things we love about you. At least I do. You bring a little laughter to my more serious side. I could stand to be a little more like you. Me too, Hannah says. I get so focused on my job and diagnosing everyone's personalities that I sometimes forget to find the joy in the little things. But that's something you do all the time. Katie and Piper chime in too, and I smile at them, but I can't help thinking about how silly I've been and how much money I've spent. Plus, I have no idea how much I still owe Jackson. Oh no, I groan. What now? I still have to pay Jackson, but I can't face him. He called in favors at the police station to get the calls traced and the fingerprints processed. I've not only wasted his time, but I've made him look like a fool, too. He'll probably hate me forever. Hannah takes my hand. I don't think he hates you. In fact, I saw the way he looked at you when he picked you up the other night, and I think he likes you. A lot. I shake my head. There's no way. He's so smart. He could never have feelings for someone like me. Besides, he was just doing his job. I paid him to hang out with me. You may have paid him, but I still think he has feelings for you, and you owe it to yourself to find out. I think I'm as humiliated as I can stand to be this year. I'll just text him and get the final bill, and then I'll send a check. Now, if you guys will excuse me, I'm going to go to bed and try to forget this last week ever happened. When I get to my room, I pull out my phone, hoping to find some of the joy I normally do in reading my video comments. But as I look back over my last videos, I realize that all my followers have been following the murder story and will want to know how it ends. How do I tell them it was all in my head? Chapter 22 Jackson I am unsurprised to see Dave and Ethan on the other side of the door when I open it. With a sigh, I step back to allow them in. Okay, are you going to tell me why you left without saying goodbye? Dave asks, following me to the couch. Or what you thought of my film? Ethan shuts the door and plops down in the recliner, crossing one leg over the other. You never leave without telling me what you think. I know it was a little darker than some of my others, but you know me, I like to push the envelope. It wasn't about your film. At least, not exactly. It was about Belle. Ethan's forehead wrinkles in confusion. Belle? The influencer? What about her? She's not just an influencer. She's our client. Jackson is protecting her from a murderer, Dave says. A murderer? Ethan cocks his head. That sounds interesting. Why didn't you tell me about this sooner? Well, you've been a little busy. But the thing is, Belle didn't witness a murder. She witnessed your movie scene. Wait, what? Ethan leans forward in the chair. Yeah, evidently in Rudolph, she witnessed the scene you were filming. I'm surprised you didn't recognize her. She said the killer looked right at her and had his accomplice chase her. Ethan sighs and shakes his head. 
I didn't film that scene. I was busy editing, so I had Eddie do it. You remember Eddie, right? I do remember Eddie, and I have no doubt he was the accomplice who chased Belle. Anyway, Belle felt like a fool after seeing your movie, so she asked me to take her home. That's why I left, and I'm pretty sure Belle won't be needing our services any longer. Do you think she'll still leave us a good review? Dave asks. I don't know. Wait. Dave draws the single syllable word out. This isn't even about the business, is it? It's about Belle. You like her. I open my mouth to argue, but there's no point. He's right, and even though I never thought I'd fall for an influencer again, Belle has somehow wormed her way into my heart. I let out a heavy sigh and nod. I do, but it doesn't matter. She thinks I think she's dumb, and I can't convince her otherwise. Then we have to figure out a way to change her mind, Ethan says. No, I'm serious, he continues when I shake my head. We've all had a rotten run of luck with women in the last year, but Belle seems amazing. And you haven't looked as happy in ages as you have the last week, Dave adds. Okay, but how? She doesn't even want to meet to discuss the final bill. She texted me asking for the amount and stated she'd send a check. Ethan taps his lips for a minute. What about her friend Charlie? Maybe she can help us. Yeah, maybe. Charlie's actually more than a friend. She's one of Belle's roommates. One of them? How many does she have? Four, though I've only met Charlie and Hannah. But how do we even contact them without Belle knowing? Silence falls as we all take a minute to think. Suddenly, a snippet of conversation flashes back in my mind. Wait, Belle said something tonight about Charlie being a personal trainer. There can't be too many gyms in Cooperville, right? I only know of a couple, Ethan says. And maybe Charlie can help in more ways than one, Dave says, patting his stomach. We better start early then, because I bet the gyms aren't open very long tomorrow. I don't know exactly how Charlie will be able to help, but the three of us begin strategizing. Christmas Eve is tomorrow, and after everything Belle has done for others, I can't let her be so down on herself, especially at Christmas. Suddenly, inspiration strikes. Ethan, if we recorded some video tomorrow, how fast could you edit it? It depends. If we get pretty good takes, it wouldn't take long at all. Why? What are you thinking? As I outline my plan, Ethan and Dave nod. This plan might not win me Belle, but it should cheer her up and maybe save the business. And that's good enough for now. Chapter 23. Belle. Guys, I don't know if I'm feeling up to celebrating tonight, I say, as Katie drags me off my bed. Normally, Christmas Eve is my favorite night of the year. We usually go out to dinner and then walk, or drive, depending on the weather, around to see the lights. Sometimes we'll even find carolers and jump in with them. But I haven't even thought about doing that tonight. In fact, I've barely left my room today. Embarrassed doesn't even begin to cover how I feel. I still don't know how I'm going to explain to my followers and I don't even want to know how much money I spent on disguises and protection. Money that isn't even all spent yet, as I still owe Jackson the other half. Too bad, Katie says, because you have a special guest. A special guest? I'm not dressed to see anyone special. I look down at my Polar Express jammies and cringe. These are great for hanging around the house, but I would never be caught dead in them in public. You look fine, Christmassy. Besides, this guest isn't going to care how you look. That means it can't be Jackson. I shouldn't be surprised after the way I left him last night, but I had been hoping that he might try to come by. However, he's probably relieved that he won't have to deal with me anymore. Merry Christmas, Belle. My feet stick, 
as I realize the mystery guest is Jackson's friend. Ethan, what are you doing here? Well, Jackson told me my movie caused a little commotion yesterday. I felt bad for the part I played in your discomfort, unknowingly, but still. So I made a new video just for you. Will you at least watch it? The other girls are already seated around the living room, so I shrug. Sure, why not? It's not like he could make things worse. Good. I was hoping you'd agree. I'd hate to have all this hard work go to waste. He smiles as he turns on the TV, taps a few buttons on his phone, and then words appear on the screen. The beauty of Belle. Suddenly, Jackson's face fills the screen. When I first met you, Belle, I thought you were self-centered and egotistical. But that had more to do with my last experience with an influencer than it did with you. I quickly learned that you are selfless and giving, and I wanted you to see how much you mean to people. The video then cuts to the hospital, and Penny's face fills the screen. Belle brings so much joy to this hospital. The kids love the toys she donates, and the parents that are having to spend Christmas in the hospital experience a little bit of relief. But what Belle probably doesn't know is that she has touched all of us, too. The camera pans back to include many of the hospital staff who smile and wave. I sniff and wipe a tear from my eyes, but the movie isn't over. It cuts to a woman I don't recognize. Hi, Belle. My name is Dana, and I know we've never met officially, but I follow all your channels. Six months ago, my longtime boyfriend left me for a younger woman, and I thought my life was over. But then I found you and your inspirational videos. You helped me see that I didn't need him to be happy and that I was beautiful just the way I was. I will never be able to thank you enough for that. Dana leaves the screen and a group of men take her place. You gave our wives confidence again, the first one says, and holds up a picture of a woman I gave a makeover to a few weeks ago. The others follow suit. How on earth did you even find these guys? I whisper under my breath. You'll see, Ethan says. And then the video cuts to the foster care center, and another tear escapes my eyes as I watch the kids open the presents I sent over. There is so much joy on their faces. The video then cuts back to Jackson. I may not know you very well, Belle, but it is clear that you are a special person and important to many. Don't let one mistake make you forget that. Merry Christmas. The video ends, and I sit in silence for a minute. Jackson is right. Confusing the movie scene for an actual murder was just a mistake. And maybe it wasn't one that everyone would make, but it's not the end of the world. My followers know me, and they know I'm a little ditzy sometimes. So most of them will probably get a good laugh out of this. And those that don't shouldn't matter to me. What I do is important. I jump up from the couch and grab my coat. Where are you going? Charlie calls. To find Jackson. I shrug into my coat. I have to tell him how I feel. I throw the door open and nearly collide with the solid chest on the other side. And how is that? He asks with a small smile. How did you... And then I realize that Jackson set this all up. He was the only person who would know how to find all these people, as he'd spent the last few days with me. I look back to find Ethan grinning at me, and then turn my attention back to Jackson. You did all this for me? Why? Because you're amazing, Belle Duval, and I couldn't let you spend Christmas down on yourself. Because even though I'd built a wall against women and influencers in general, you managed to break through that wall and make me feel something again. Because even though it's only been a few days, I really want to spend more time with you, and I was afraid you'd no longer need my services, although we still haven't figured out who is sending you those gifts. Actually, we have, I say, biting my lip. The presents weren't for me. Evidently, Popper has a secret admirer. I glance back, and she flashes a tiny embarrassed wave. Jackson chuckles. Well, 
The presents may not have been for you, but I guarantee that you have an admirer too, and I would really like to spend Christmas with you, if you'll let me. I'd like that too. I haven't been able to stop thinking about you since that kiss. I can feel the heat spreading across my face as I look up at him. Hmm. Me either. I guess it's a good thing I brought this with me. From behind his back, he brings out a sprig of mistletoe and holds it over our heads. You know what they say about mistletoe. I bite back a smile. I do, and I also know that it's bad luck not to kiss under the mistletoe. I've had enough bad luck that I think it would be a crime to chance it. I wholeheartedly agree. His free hand snakes around my waist and pulls me close. My hands slide up behind his neck, and then his face lowers to mine. His lips feel like a feather as they brush mine, and then I'm lifting on my toes to deepen the kiss. Though I know it's cliche, I swear I hear fireworks go off in the background, and a tingle courses through my body down to my toes. From behind us, I hear clapping and whistling. I pull back and grin up at Jackson. I forgot for a moment that we have an audience. I'm surprised you let it bother you, he says, brushing a stray strand of hair behind my ear. I figured you'd be used to having an audience. I give his arm a playful punch. I am, but not for kissing. Not that I've kissed anyone in a while. I mean, I've not not kissed people, but... I stop realizing that Jackson is smiling at me. I know what you mean, and I'm happy to be the one to take over that role from now on. Now that you're done kissing, can you guys come inside and shut the door? Hannah calls. It's getting cold in here with the door open. Oh, right. Sorry. I step back and Jackson enters, but pulls out his phone as he does. Do you guys mind if I tell Dave he can come up too? He's waiting in the car. You left him waiting in the car? Jackson shrugs. Well, I didn't know for sure that you'd let me in, so I needed a ride home just in case, and I couldn't very well not bring him since Ethan and I were here. Actually, how about we all go join him outside and go see some Christmas lights? I think my Christmas spirit has returned. I smile and squeeze Jackson's hand. The girls all agree and scatter to get their coats. I'll tell Dave what we're doing, Ethan says, and heads for the front door. Aren't we going to? Jackson asks when the girls follow Ethan out the door. But I hang back. I hold up a finger. In a minute, I have a Christmas gift for you. He tilts his head at me, but I simply smile and pull out my phone. I tap the social media icon and begin the video. Merry Christmas, everyone. I thought I'd give you an update on my situation. The phantom calls have stopped. It turns out they were my sister who was having problems with her new phone. The secret admirer gifts were actually from my roommate, Piper. And the murder I thought I witnessed turned out to be part of a documentary someone was working on. I guess you could say it was a merry mistake. But the one thing that wasn't a mistake was hiring Jackson Powers to protect me. I step back, so Jackson is in the screen with me. Even though my situation turned out to be nothing, Jackson was by my side every day making sure I was safe. I hope you don't find yourself in a situation where you need a bodyguard, but if you do, the Powers Protection Agency is the only number you'll ever need. We're going to go see some lights now, but I hope you all have a Merry Christmas with the ones you love. I end the video and tuck my phone back in my pocket. You didn't have to do that, but thank you. I don't know if it will be enough to keep the business going, but I certainly appreciate it. I smile and grab his arm. I meant every word. And maybe if the bodyguard thing doesn't work out, we can try a dating service. Katie's been in a funk since her fiancé broke up with her. I bet you have a few handsome friends we could introduce her to. Jackson laughs and shakes his head. Merry Christmas, Belle. And when he kisses me this time, I have a feeling that every Christmas with him will be just as merry as this one. The end. 
I would love it if you would leave a review for a merry mistake at your favorite retailer. Just a few words really helps. And I have a special gift of deleted scenes that you can get just for signing up for my newsletter. And if you want to read Katie's story, turn the page for a sneak peek. This has been A Merry Mistake, The Fab Five Book One, written by Lorena Hoops. Copyright 2023. Narrated by Lorena Hoops. Audio copyright 2023.